All right, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. If you're joining us live on Facebook, thank you. You can type in your questions or on YouTube as well. You can type in those questions. We'll get to them after we record, go through the normal podcast. Uh, so go ahead and type them in all throughout because we scan back through. And then uh, once we're live, of course, you're welcome. Or once we're actually entertaining those questions, you can ask more as well. But um, with that, let's just jump right into the regular podcast. Sound good? Welcome to the podcast that's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee with our head coach, Chad Zimmerman. Hi, everybody. Our CEO, Nate Pearson. Hi, everybody. And we are going to answer. <laughs> that was awesome. United. That's pretty good. <laughs> We're going to answer more of your cycling and triathlon related questions today. You can submit them at trainerroad.com slash podcast. You get a lot of them. This week, we got hundreds and Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of questions this week. So Jonathan goes through all of them. So I do. I do. thank you, Jonathan, for doing that. While. But it's awesome. And, and I, we say this a lot, but I want to answer every one of them, but, um, we just don't have the bandwidth to do that. The we other day I figured it out. I have an idea. So go ahead first. Okay, you, so what'd you figure out this week? Um, I would be, I would be having to answer this week with the questions that came in. I'd be having to answer nine questions every minute. And these are like pretty long questions. Some of these questions, it takes nine minutes to hmm. read. Right. So uh, it's a lot. So yeah, but some fun math. We have we try to pick every question, uh, or we try to pick questions that have broad applicability, and also offer some entertainment too. So so what we do? This is a marketing effort. Gotcha. We say Jonathan's going to stream live for seventy two hours <laughs> and answer these questions. Chad and I can come in for bathroom breaks, <laughs> like when he has to go, and we'll five but ten minutes at a time. We can pick come up back. The slack, yeah, yeah, and he can break some world record. Uh, that way we and we'll we'll publish it a live stream marathon shall we say exactly nice. what do you think uh sure i mean <laughs> I <think. laughs> if you think that's a good idea please uh <laughs> comment send in a question too just kidding i can't say no but uh yeah um with that before we get into the normal questions that we have a couple things that we want to mention nate i'll let you take this first part okay number one uh we are going to start including a image thumbnail of your Strava ride when it uploads to Strava. That's not the big announcement we're talking about. That's another kind of business thing because there's not a public way to do it. But so that's going to be there. I believe it's going up maybe as you're recording this podcast, but it's going to be very soon. The image, it's nice, nice and clean, doesn't have any numbers on it, but it does give you, it gives you two things. One, it's an easy way to look back because even being at Trainer Own, Chad, you've written all these workouts. Sometimes you hear a workout name and you don't really remember what the actual yeah. workout was. Yeah. There's yeah. so many of them. And then by looking at the picture, you know exactly what you did Dig and it. you know what you, um, how you did it. Did I turn it down? Did I have back pedals? Did I end it too early? So that's nice having your Strava feed. Two, there's a little bit of accountability too, is <laughs> if I know that people are actually not gonna just see the name of it, but actually see the image of it. Yeah. I, I don't want to give up at the end. Right. right? People are going to see oh, what yeah. I did. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, so we've been taking pictures of our own train road accounts <clears throat> yeah. and, and just uploading them automatically. Manually. But I mean, sure. what, if I bail early, people mention it, right? <laughs> yeah. Chad, have you experienced the same thing? Oh, yeah. 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 I, I think I quit Pettit one time and I took a lot of, a lot <laughs> Pettit's of crap a recovery for that. workout for those that don't know. <laughs> well, it's it's low day. anaerobic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so it, it, uh, I'm just saying that, like, uh, you've experienced the motivational aspect of having people see your workout Every after workout. the fact. Yep. Yep. It happens. So, so it also makes it a little easier, like, um, when you share your workouts with your friends and everything else, they'll get a better idea of what you're doing, which is which is nice. Yeah, too. like, like was it really, really hard, or was that easy? Exactly. Not everyone knows that Taku is exactly. easy. Walk in the park. Yeah, yeah. walk in the park, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So that's going to be pretty cool. Keep your eyes peeled. And if you haven't already set it up, you can actually sync uh, Trainer Road with Strava. You just log in to your Trainer Road account, go into your profile, and then you can sync up different accounts um, from Garmin Connect, Strava, that sort of thing. Uh, and then it can push and pull and lots of cool stuff. Uh, do you want to mention the beta tester group? Yes, because it's, there's on Facebook, there's a Trainer Road beta tester group. And in there, we have done an announcement of the new thing we've been teasing a bunch, mm -hmm. but I've just teased you more because you have to go in the group <laughs> to know what it is. And we're pretty excited about it, too. Yes. So we've been using it internally for months. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we like it because mm -hmm. <laughs> we made it. I'm a fan. Yeah, yeah we're yeah. a fan. Um, but to get, we're having people uh, start the beta, mm -hmm. and I think we're going to start letting people in. Like, we, we have a list of people. I think after this podcast, people are going to start coming into it. Mm -hmm. And we're doing a... Um, just so everyone knows, it's a slow release. So uh, 
where it's a, it's a very, it took us a year to build this, right? So there's a lot of stuff in there and we want to do groups of maybe like a hundred people at a time mm-hmm. so that we don't put everyone at once. And then we have so many things that we're running around and, you know, the idea is to find bugs and things that we might've missed or use cases that we missed and just make it awesome. So if you want to learn more about that, go to train or beta testers. We will do a full it's on like Facebook. Yep. yep. Mm-hmm. Um, we will do a full podcast about it and talk about all the features and everything yeah th- i'm excited for, for that three years so we can probably do um and keep your eyes peeled for that we'll probably do a screen share so you can actually see what we're talking about too <laughs> which will yeah. be which will be good uh that'll be a ton of i, I think that'll be great uh, i i like leaked very minor information on my instagram account yesterday like very brief overview stuff and i didn't share any of the details and i promise you once you guys see the details that's when it's really gonna mm. like hit so uh there's a lot of awesome stuff in there so gonna be great uh, Chad, uh, you put down, so we have a document that we work off of for this every week that we prepare. Um, and Chad put in something before we went in here. Yeah. Um, do you want to, I'll let you just take it. On sure. Yeah. Yeah. So this is just from my, my, uh, for the record clarification, just little mm-hmm. cleanup tasks, things that uh, I realized after the podcast, I maybe didn't explain as well as I wanted to. Maybe I forgot something completely. In any case, it's a chance for me to kind of, uh, do a better job than, than I feel I did. Um, in one of the, or one of the topics, and, and I, for whatever reason, every time we talk about pedal stroke drills, I neglect to mention these two things. And these are two primary motivators for these drills, why these drills are still here, why they were here in the first place, why they are here. Um, it, I mean, we talk about, we're not looking to generate more power from the pedal stroke. We're simply looking to make the pedal stroke more efficient, et cetera. Uh, that that kind of touches on what I'm after, but in particular, a couple things, um, one is quad sparing. So, so our quads are largely responsible for driving the pedal stroke. And if there's anything we can do to save them just a millisecond, every pedal stroke, every of those thousands of pedal strokes we do mm-hmm. in an hour uh, or uh, multiple hours, there's benefit in that. Okay. Even if it's just learning to turn it off slightly earlier in the pedal stroke, learning to activate it a little later, heading, heading down into the downstroke. Mm-hmm. Jonathan, have you ever done that? Like on a long climb, <laughs> been like, oh, I'm going to start scraping my feet for a while to like... Yeah. To yeah. have my quad stop hurting so much. You know what I think of is like when a rocket launches off and it like jettisons one thing and turns on another thing. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. one's That's out a good of way gas. To <laughs> we need yeah, to totally. bring another one in. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And so. that that kind of goes hand in hand with another thing that you know we practice whether we recognize it or not. And it's there's something called agonist antagonist coactivation. So you know for every muscle there's an opposing muscle. Otherwise we'd be frozen in one position, right? We need one muscle to flex the joint and the other muscle to extend the joint. And in the case of the pedal stroke, we're looking at you know our, our quads activate on the downstroke. And then, and then it is possible to carry tension in your hamstrings, you know, so, so those antagonist muscles can actually work against your pedal stroke. Mm. And by refining that fluidity in your pedaling action, you can start to negate some of that coactivation, try to let your hamstrings relax when they shouldn't be involved and let your ham or your quads relax when they're done with, yeah. with their, so that, cause you can actually, if you think about it, I mean, when you push down on the pedal stroke, you can keep a lot of tension in your hamstrings at the same time that benefits nobody. There's no, there's no point in doing that. Yep. And with these pedal stroke drills, you know, over time, we start to iron out that, that coactivation. That's a hundred percent right. And I, I feel like that's something that I haven't articulated before, but with the knee problems and everything else, usually when I have an imbalance or mm-hmm. something else where I haven't devoted enough attention to proper strength training or balance within my muscle groups, I, I carry tension through my hamstring specifically mm-hmm. throughout the whole entire pedal stroke or maybe my lower leg, for example. Yeah, we get all types of compensation and, and then, most of it's not yeah. beneficial in terms of, you know, efficiency, letting the muscles that shouldn't be firing actually relax while the muscles that should be firing do the work. Totally. You've just like totally changed my workout today, <laughs> right? Because I, I can sit here and squeeze or like flex my leg and I can flex my quad, my hamstring. Yeah, right. Right. And I'm thinking, well, am I pedaling? Am I, yeah. what you're saying, am I really like relaxing my hamstring when I should be pushing Probably down? Probably not. I mean, it's, it's a conscious measure for quite some time mm-hmm. until you learn to do it more naturally. And I think even more so, am I relaxing my quad on, on the upstroke? You know what I mean? Again, yep. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And this is a marginal gain here, but I feel like this sort of work, especially if you race gravel, uh, or if you're racing mountain bikes, yeah, I think it's it stops really being helpful. marginal when you consider the repetition. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, I, I just think that when you are racing on uneven surfaces like that, the ability to have dynamic control over muscle groups and be able to to operate them independently and have like a very clearly established communication line down mm-hmm. to that, it yeah. really does help you become more efficient. We talk, we've talked about this a number of times. How a lot of the time, a really good road rider will get onto a mountain bike and it'll be a 
pretty straightforward climb. It's not like it's a technical single track climb. And you can see those inefficiencies. But it'll have like, you know, it'll have some some rock or or something off camber slightly or something like that. And those little nuances of being able to control how your muscles are making those pedals go over really go a long way when traction becomes marginalized or gearing and pitch has you in a in a tough spot. It's where I really notice it making a difference. Yep. I think too with the the far end of that when you're doing a triathlon and you're in a fixed one position the whole time mm -hmm. and you're just always using your quads always using your quads a little like be able to change that mm -hmm. is, is a sweet relief like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. And we got and this is kind of going off of that in a different direction but that nails home the importance of an important the importance of an important bike fit or a good <laughs> bike fit i should say oh yeah like how we got our bike fits we actually when we started to get into the proper position we started to recognize that it wasn't just all quad anymore yeah now we are using posterior chain so if you're in a bad spot then it might just be tough to, to yeah, I, don't, I don't know if you intended that segue but that's actually the other point i wanted to make in, in my for the record clarification um, mm -hmm. uh, bit here you guys talked about how it's impossible to keep your sit bones engaged when you get into that arrow position. I still disagree with that. So I kind of want to hear where, you know, what uh, I'm, I'm guessing it's something Dan said, but I've, I've looked at, I've looked at, started combing photos of Bradley Wiggins, um, Tony Martin, Fabian Cancellara. I mean, guys who obviously put a lot of power to the pedals and what their pelvic position was as they're doing it, regardless of how arrow or narrow they, they are. Mm -hmm. And in some of them, in some cases, yeah, they're tipped forward. And I don't know that that's necessarily I think it might just be how they were riding at the moment. I don't know if that's a bike fit issue, but it seems to me, and I would still still argue that a grounded pelvis is, is regardless of how arrow, and if you have to lose that anchored position, I think you're becoming too arrow. You're going to lose comfort. Comfort's going to cost you power. Becoming too arrow? Power's going to cost you, <laughs> yeah, too arrow. Huh. Yeah, like a too Absolutely, arrow too for arrow. The power, you're saying. You yeah, want to be able comfort to first. Yeah. I mean, if comfort breaks down, then, yeah. then power goes away. Aerodynamics goes away because you start coming out of position. I mean, comfort first. It sounds a little I think, odd, but I think that we probably misspoke on that because it's not that your pelvis isn't grounded or mm -hmm. or, or stabilized on mm -hmm. the saddle, um, but we were talking about how since your hip angle opens up in a TT position a lot of the time, mm -hmm. and then you're leaned over and you're stretched out perhaps a little forward, right, with your with your arrow bars in that position, rather than having your pelvis rolled back as far, your pelvis is rolled forward. However, it's still grounded, and okay. it's not rolled forward to the point that you're leaning on soft tissue, gotcha. right? Like it's not that far forward. Okay, At least I that's assume what I that's yeah what you guys meant, but I wanted yeah. to know. It's different saddles. Some saddles are designed to ride, be ridden this way, with more of like the front of not your sit bones, it's mm. front of the pelvis. Yeah. And the idea is because of the, especially with, Dan explains it really well with the fist fitting system, mm -hmm. is that as you, I'm trying to, I don't know how to show with my hands, but if you're, you're rotating, podcast, you can see you, this it way. doesn't really help though. So <laughs> um, you're rotating forward. So you're going up, you're going forward, up and down, forward, up and down. Mm -hmm. And if you, you have to then keep your pelvis in the same relation to your body as you're going forward, up and down. Yeah, forward, that much down. makes sense to me. And yeah. then in, you know, there's like the the ISM saddles, um, the Dash saddle, uh, Cobb saddles, um, some of the new specialized, like the specialized uh, Power or Sotero. Sotero, I'm thinking Sotero. Yeah, uh -huh. it's like it's made to be kind of like written, almost like you're falling off the front hmm. a bit. Yeah, yeah. and I, I I might be doing it wrong, but I've heard and it fell like you. You ride where it's like kind of on either side of that. Uh, what's the nerve called down there? Perennial That's the, nerve, right? Yeah, the worst mm -hmm. nerve ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it's, uh, aggravate, it's yeah. either side of there, and my sit bones aren't touching at all. Yeah. Um, and it, it takes a special saddle to be able to ride there and not have pain. And out of all those saddles I mentioned, I think I've tried almost all of them, hmm. yeah. and only maybe like two of them I don't have pain. And it's also too like you get used to it. Yeah. So far, well, I mean, you only rode it in a bike fit, but the dash you really liked it first yeah. try. So. I did, but it, again, yeah, it's on a fitting bike, so yeah. who knows if that'll be the long-term saddle. And the one interesting thing is, even though you're rolled forward like that, there's still the the pelvis is pretty shallowly guarded by by tissue in that area as well, so yeah. it's still pretty well. It's it's making some good contact. Something along these lines. Sorry, we're kind of digressing, but I found it really interesting. I saw on Tony Martin's bike, his Canyon, he still is running. So. Stepping back, there was uh, there's a photo that's pretty gruesome of Tony Martin riding Sand a TT paper. bike at uh, Virginia in the World Champs, and when he's riding that, he has sandpaper on his saddle, and it's worn completely through his chamois, and he's bloody in terrible spots, and it looks just absolutely miserable. 
But the, the reasoning that I heard behind that, and this is obviously rumor at this point now, but was that he couldn't get a good bike fit with that TT bike for him. So as a result, he had to be in somewhat of a compromised position, and the grip tape helped no, him that's, stay there. He did have to modify his position for a while, and then he went to, you know, that's why he got crushed so bad, or at least what he attributes mm-hmm. getting crushed so bad at, at said, the Olympics, yeah. and then he goes back to Worlds on the previous fit, the one that had worked for him. Yeah. No longer those problems. And the interesting thing, though, he's now on the Canyon, uh, which, which allows for a more flexible fit, or at least it's known to provide a more flexible mm-hmm. fit. Who knows if it allows the constraints that he needs, but that's what they've said, at least. And he's got even more grip tape. That top of that saddle is very <laughs> much covered in grip tape. It's really interesting to but see. But see, th- that is actually the argument I was making, in that he he became too arrow. His position was so slippery that it was costing him comfort. Mm-hmm. That comfort was costing him power. I mean, it's just a this is vicious cycle. Yeah. Then he went back to a position that was a little less aerodynamic, substantially more powerful, wins a world championship. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see how he performs. Because, I mean, the one thing I can think of, I'm sure, when he wore through, the sandpaper wore through everything else, that level of discomfort has to distract from being able to ride if you're grinding on on sandpaper in that area. But mm. but it's it's going to be really interesting to see how this all plays out with finding the right position. And also, I wonder if a lot of those athletes, depending on the duration of the TT that they're prepping for, mm-hmm. if they like if they're they have the facility with mechanics and with everything else and with wind tunnel testing that they know that like this is my 20 minute position right yeah. like mm-hmm. this sure. is my 15 minute position oh. this might be my 40k oh position. yeah the importance yeah. of comfort grows with the duration yeah. of the event triathletes have that totally and a lot of the stuff too you see in the at the grand tour level it's it's the uci is dictating position mm-hmm. and you see them like you i think you usually see them scooting forward mm-hmm. right they keep scooting forward because yeah. they want to be in that steeper position and open up their hip angle yeah. so as they push forward they want that but they can't push their saddle any more forward mm-hmm. than what they're at in yeah. triathlete uh, triathletes out there you don't have that right so you don't need to do it and if a, a sign i think of a bad bike fit is as you're riding you keep moving your yes. bottom back and forth and you're like this doesn't feel right the whole time yeah yeah you can see video of him of tony martin doing yeah. exactly yeah. that sliding forward pushing himself back sliding forward yep. and you're basically fighting yourself the entire time Al- alberto contador did that uh mm-hmm. when the tt's against when lance came back just the whole time he won the tt yeah. but he, the whole time like i think he was playing butyrol but or whatever <laughs> yeah, it was something yeah. like that yeah, something yeah. made the difference uh, he got but just the uh, the idea that you can if you're sliding back all the time, it's a bad thing. And something that's interesting, too, that I thought of this week is, so the way that uh, one of the constraints that's measured by the UCI is from the saddle, the nose of the saddle they measure, which I find silly because in the end, saddles are different lengths, mm-hmm. right? But a lot of these pros, I was wondering why they aren't using snub nose saddles for pro TTs. But I think the reason for it is a lot of them have found that even if it's a snub nose saddle, where they sit or where they need to sit, still there's too much nose there. So they have these long noses on these saddles where the nose is more effective on a traditional saddle to sit on rather than a snub-nosed one where it's Mm. like smaller and more diminutive. So they have a long nose saddle and it's extremely uncomfortable probably, but that allows them to alter their position, so to speak, because it's more broad than the normal snub-nosed saddles. Uh, The snub. So... I I think part of that might be tradition too of it not very wanting well to could be right because yeah. the snub nose saddles like they're made to sit right on the edge like the, right on the very edge yeah. yeah the only downside is that a lot of them taper off very early or they lose a lot of padding early whereas a traditional saddle that they might be using like Tony Martin's is pretty thick and padded looking relatively speaking yeah. and yeah. it has a long broad nose and you can tell even though he's he should would be sitting there that dude is sitting right on the tip of that saddle you know to try to to be better there so i it's it's interesting to see how they have these things set up and like you said and this is like the hugest grain of salt that you should always keep handy whenever you look at something from the pro peloton remember that the fact that tradition reigns in many cases supreme yeah. in that sport so you really have to not every decision is purely data driven you know and uh i can never say this brand was it physique 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 uh physique i don't think they have a snub nose do they I don't think so. But a lot of this stuff is uh, sponsors. And I know sometimes yeah. people get away with saddles that are not their sponsors and they scrap, scratch them off. But yeah. I think if you're at that level, you kind of ride the sponsor stuff because that's yeah. what they want. That's what they're paying for, for to have Tony Martin ride your saddle. Sure. Exactly. And I'm not sure if that's the brand for Tony Mar- Martin. Right. But I'm just thinking some of these bigger brands don't have any stuff. Sponsor ones. obligations dictate. Yeah, exactly. Equipment Which choices, you ride. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Just like you said, the Canyon might not have, the old Canyon might not have fit him. But he had to ride one. He was, totally. If he showed up on a different bike, it yep. would have been weird. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That one's pretty hard to cover up with. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with that, let's get into – so this is a question. We aren't going to address a specific individual's question, uh, but this is a question that we get a lot. 
A lot of people are talking about this. Part of this is because it's very much a, a topic that's in vogue in nutrition right now, but ketosis and cycling and how they relate. We've talked about low carb approaches. We've tested low carb approaches. We've tested high carb approaches on the podcast. And we've talked about at least our personal experiences with how they've worked out. But in an effort to kind of get down to, to brass tacks on this a bit and to more talk about what's going on in your body, we wanted to take some time to talk about keto versus, you know, keto versus high fat and low carb diets and get into this and, and kind of figure out what goes on in your body. Yeah. Um, Chad, do you want to kick this off? And sure. We'll, yeah. We'll I mean, work through this together. Any, so. Anybody who's followed the podcast for any length of time knows that, you know, we're, we're not opposed to nutritional experimentation. Nate, <laughs> Nate and me, especially <laughs> Nate, a little more publicly, me a little more privately, but still, um, my approach has kind of been to figure out stuff that's not necessarily performance enhancing. I've mm-hmm. spent the last couple of years figuring certain things out in the interest of just better health all around, but uh, very little of what I've done has actually benefited my performance. And trying to go keto adapted uh, has been one of those things. And, and we'll get into the specifics of why exactly it didn't work for me, why it probably doesn't work for most uh, Bike racers. Let's just say bike racers. Okay, um, cool. Yeah. So yeah, we'll we'll treat we're treating that context here because the one thing that I know that with especially with ketosis is a lot of folks will bring in other other examples of of, of different athletes and everything else. But we're going to yeah, talking there, there is the an athlete type bike racing. where it's kind of suitable. And we understand like nutrition is so uh, like people are so passionate about it. And if <laughs> yeah. you say like cult like, oh yeah, it, no, it is is cult right? Yeah. yeah. If we talk, you know, we say something bad about. I'm going to pick on paleo people, paleo people for a second. Yeah. They're going to like show up at the office, right? <laughs> yeah. With CrossFit dumbbells. Yeah. And like, what are you doing? Yeah. Certain dietary approaches cert- suit certain types of athletes. There's yeah. the, you can't argue that. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of support. You should, you can certainly argue. You can always argue it, yeah. but uh, there's a lot of support. So uh, we'll get into why there's, I don't think a lot of support for a ketogenic diet and our type or you know actual bike racers okay cool um so so first the distinction between uh being ketogenic and just being on high fat i mean you can up the fat percentage of your diet and not be anywhere near ketogenic ketogenic implies that you've limited your carbohydrates to a point where your body has to find glucose and brain fuel basically elsewhere Mm -hmm. so so let's let's make it simple like that um in the absence of carbohydrate or in the presence of uh, vastly diminished carbohydrate intake again that glucose has to come from somewhere your 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 brain thrives on glucose Mm -hmm. it can operate on ketones um but and and that's kind of what what leads to this adaptation assuming you restrict carbohydrate far enough Mm -hmm. so once carbohydrates not there your body shifts into a different mode it starts utilizing fat Um, part of that fat um, is a glycerol backbone so your triglycerides three fatty acids tied to a glycerol backbone that glycerol can be metabolized in the liver converted to glucose so there's a bit of glucose Mm -hmm. it's probably not enough glucose um, and i don't know if this is exactly how it works but the part of the uh, one of the byproducts of the the fat processing the Mm -hmm. lipolysis are ketone bodies. So those ketone bodies can be used in a number of places, one of which is the brain. So in any case, now you're operating on different fuel sources. So instead of the typical glucose with a bit of fat, now it's predominantly fat with a bit of ketones and still a little bit of glucose in there. And a lot of people, so ketones can be naturally produced in your body. They're, they're produced uh, under a number of circumstances. Okay. Yeah. And then people also can, they, they take them too. And we won't get too far into like how yeah, to become ketogenic ketones. and yeah, everything else. Let's not even get into that. But uh, when when you do this, I, I think that correct me if I'm wrong, and I may be very wrong on this, but the theory is when you get down into that state where you deprive yourself of taking in carbohydrate uh-huh. and you get into a spot where you're low on that, then your body is the, what the intended benefit is to increase the amount of ketones that your body is yeah, producing. Yeah, and, and really fat, honestly. I mean, the ketones are almost a almost a side or a byproduct or a happy accident or oh, gotcha. reaction it's it's really about becoming fat adapted and becoming able to better utilize fat as your primary fuel source i'm going to summarize a different way i eat so little carbs that i start burning fat yeah yep. yeah hey that's it pretty simply but yeah. but this is not something that just happens it happens over i mean it has you have to go to great lengths you have to really restrict your carbohydrate intake and you have to go through a, a pretty shaky period how many carbs like how how much do you have to restrict it I, the number they typically land on is, is like, I've seen as low as 30%. Some people can get into a ketogenic state with carbohydrate as low as 30%. In most cases, 30% of your, 30% of your, your diet. Wow. Mm -hmm. In most cases, it's like 10% or lower. I mean, people have to severely restrict carbohydrate. I was here. I always read like uh, 20 to 30 grams of carbs, like yeah, and I guess that depends, right, on yeah. how much you're taking. And it in. does depend. That's another thing. So some people can get keto adapted in the matter of a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Some people it can take months 
for them to, to fully adapt. How can you tell if you're keto adapted? Uh, you have to actually measure ketones. I mean, you can probably do it a little more uh, organically. I mean, you could probably actually feel it, but you have to have some basis to know to know what you're feeling. And yeah, I know you get that like um, you get that ammonia smell in your breath, like that's a fruity heard. ammonia yeah, smell. Yeah, and that's that's one sign of ketones. It doesn't necessarily mean you're um, keto keto adapted, mm -hmm. um, but you do. You have to measure. I mean, there's ketones in your urine, although that's not the most reliable way because that dissipates as you become keto adapted. There's ketones in your blood, and there's ketones in your breath. They have breath analyzers. Blood's the you know the, the gold standard, the way to go. But ketone strips are expensive. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's quite a process. So you really have to get behind this. Yeah. I mean, this has to be full, full commit. You can't kind of fake this and, and ease your way into it. I it's can't kind of an all or nothing thing. I can't on the weekends eat donuts and Popeyes. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and we'll talk about that. That's, yeah. that's like a weak form of carb cycling, which is how a keto adapted athlete tries to reintegrate carbohydrate into their diet such that they can engage on in high intensity activities. Interesting. So, See, let's, go, sorry. Ahead. Yeah, what? I was going to say, Let's work our way toward now looking at it from an endurance athlete's perspective or a yeah. cyclist perspective. I got the segue. Okay, good. So <laughs> I've always heard carbs are good for cyclists. Yeah. So how would a how could a a fat adapted athlete without carbs, like how does that all work? It, it, it doesn't work very well, quite honestly. I mean, you basically have a, a ceiling, and that ceiling is sub threshold. I mean, you can't do a heck of a lot of work that requires sugar. You can't get anaerobic for very long. There's not a lot of glucose in the system. There's not a lot of fuel to fuel anaerobic metabolism. Mm -hmm. So, so your, your workload or your work level is severely limited, which in the case of, and we've talked about this before, ultra endurance athletes, people who have to go for long periods of time, uh, can't take on food frequently, don't want to take on food frequently, but can, you can burn at a low rate. Can 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 you know better use fat to fuel really long low intensity efforts? This is something that is well suited. As you get, as you're more in ketogenic, does your the level of what you can operate aerobically rise, or is it just kind of the same? Yeah, and that's exactly what happens. So your aerobic uh, capabilities rise way up, and and you push that threshold aerobically closer. Well, anyway. Uh, to your to your VO2 max, mm -hmm. but you become very aerobically adept, really good at metabolizing fat for fuel. And and that's and part of that and the appeal to that that I see a lot of people going with is got plenty of fat on board. Sure, um, mm -hmm. and we all do. Yep. So in in theory, it's kind of like I'm like a camel, right? Like I got I got all yeah. the fuel no, I need real. to keep going. Yep. Um, but that said, so there are certain like if you're doing like uh, if you're doing something like a full distance Ironman bike leg, for example. That's, you know, an effort where you're going to be under threshold uh, because, you know, five hour race, something Still like that. Still pretty high. Though. Well but under, the, but. And then there are other things to consider, too. So and, and I wanted to bring that up because I, I'm sure there's somebody going, but like, but wait, my racing isn't over threshold. Right. Mm -hmm. Like somebody might be saying that, mm -hmm. but that doesn't. Necessarily but even as you work toward better. threshold, you're you, there's more and more anaerobic contribution. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, again, the aerobic fibers can only do so much. They're 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 low force. high. Uh, yeah, low force, high fatigue rate, or uh, low fatigue fibers. I mean, yeah. they're, they're set up to do a particular job. Fat can fuel that job really well. We're back to Carbohydrate that same, can as well. We're back to that same like uh, light switch or fader uh, argument in the sense that like I think a mm -hmm. lot of people think that they're just, they're at, if they're underneath a certain level, then it's just a light switch. And then if they surpass that, it changes. Mm -hmm. But like you said, there is anaerobic contribution the closer you get yep. to that threshold. And, and the bummer of this is if you're a glycolytic athlete, an athlete who needs to be able to process glycogen, who needs to be able to do those super threshold efforts or ride close to threshold for long periods of time, fat, ad fat adaptation or keto adaptation can actually damage your ability to utilize gly glycogen. Yeah, so, so that's, there's a severe downside. Like if, if you have a big race and you start to take uh, carbs in, it's hard to use them, right? switch back and forth like that. Yeah. There, there are adaptations that, that, that occur that take time. So to go back and forth is problematic. And, and some athletes talk about cycling carbohydrate into their diets in preparation for more yeah. glycolytic events. And there's plenty of science that says that doesn't really work. Hmm. Here's my, here's my like, uh, I, I don't think this point gets conveyed enough. So let's say it's an Ironman athlete, right? And maybe just during the Ironman bike leg, you're like, yeah, that's great. If I could operate at a higher percentage of fat, that'd be great. Be more aerobic the whole time. Wonderful. But think about your training, let's say over eight months. And let's say your, your first FTP is 220, right? And then you spend, you go into ketosis and you get, you push really high against that 220, but you're never really training over that 220 because mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to do. And it's, I mean, you're in ketosis, right? Mm -hmm. So come Ironman race day, let's say you're at still 220, but you're, you can operate at like 210, right? 210 yeah. Watts for yeah. a really long time. Mostly aerobic. Let's take athlete two. 
and they're at 220 and they're eating carbs and doing over unders and threshold and VO2 max intervals and really building it up and doing two by twenties. Right. And they get up to 270 mm-hmm. FTP yeah. and now they race at 230, 240. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, yep. and, uh, they are now a faster athlete and probably burning a higher percentage of fat than the athlete that stayed down there at that same threshold, yeah, but really got argument. pushed up to it. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Really, you just shift your substrate preference. You're just, you know, you used to rely heavily on carbohydrate. Now you're really good at relying primarily on fat. Mm-hmm. Doesn't necessarily make you faster. It just makes you a more efficient fat burner. The, so, the other point I want to say too, is yeah. if I was running those Western States 100 right out this window, uh, it's a hundred uh, mile running race. Yeah, that's Let's a say case. I'm already at a really high level. Right. Yep. And now I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm kind of bonking in these races. I can't, there's not, I'm not going to push my pace up another two, three minutes. Now I want to try to get it where I'm going to burn more and more and more fat at that really long. Yep. I don't know how it, it's, it's forever. It's crazy. Yeah. It's insane. So, um, but that's, I could see that as a, a strong argument to, to be in ketosis. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, in, in those multi-hour events, you can't necessarily keep up with your, your carbohydrate expenditure, your energy expenditure. You can only take in so much glucose over the course of those races. So if you start to deplete, you, you can't keep up with it. Muscle glycogen is really good at maintaining intensity, but once those glycogen stores are, are depleted, refilling them or, or, or keeping uh, sugar to the muscles via what you eat becomes really limited. Yet something that I want to touch on with this too, is I see a lot of people think, well, that way I don't have to carry food with me or I'm not relying upon aid stations. Mm -hmm. And while I could definitely see that being the case for certain races, especially if it's just like a point to point type of a thing, you're on your own. I could see that as being like a good fail safe, right? In the sense that you could rely on that. Mm -hmm. But in the majority of cases, we don't have to worry about that. Like Western States 100, I think it has an aid station every eight miles. I think I looked at No, I thought you said two miles. Or every four miles. I think it's like four miles, right? So plenty of that stuff there. There's usually well-stocked aid stations carrying food in a bike race. In most cases, I know there are edge cases, but in most cases, it's really not that tough. The one part that's tempting for me about this is the fact that since I I, I have a sensitive stomach and it gets upset by a lot of nutrition products. So in my mind, I'm thinking my body wouldn't get upset by just taking, you know, taking in its own fat and being really fuel or effectively fueled off that. But I know, and I've, I've, I haven't reached anything that would be even close to ketosis. I'm sure. Uh, having increased my fat adaptation, I have noticed the fact that while it may help me on long days on the bike, it doesn't necessarily help me in the type of racing that I do every day. Yeah, which you're not is really more intense. Improving fat adaptation so much as improving your ability to oxidize fat. There I mean, go. and that's just something endurance training conveys anyway. Happens yeah, that's anyway. that's a good point, right? So the the more I train and and the more I raise my threshold, I'm going to burn more fat at that same w- mm-hmm. wattage. Exactly. Um, what we just talked about, what you just talked about, triathletes have known this for years as they say nutrition is a sport, totally. right? Mm-hmm. I- inside of triathlon. Mm-hmm. And you, uh, they, they say, I have to train with what I'm going to have in the race day because it is hard to get in, to Chad's point, the amount of calories mm-hmm. um, that you need for the race. Mm-hmm. So they, they're doing it. And it's, I, I, I don't have any uh, science on this, but just anecdotal, if you do it a lot, it gets way easier. Yes. Like if you're eating gels every time you're eating the same gels and you're used to it when you're racing or when you're in, when you're training, it's easier than on race day to, to digest that same gel. You have to train your nutrition too. Yeah. I almost, I, I see ketogenic adaptation more as a lifestyle that dictates which sort of races you can then do. I don't, I don't mm. like mm. pursuing a keto diet in anticipation of furthering your performance or improving your performance in a particular uh, sporting realm. Yeah. Rather you, you, this is more about you know an improved lifestyle or a different lifestyle um, the, the other benefits that come along with it, and then figuring out how you can tailor your uh, athletic lifestyle to, to, to work with your keto-adapted yep. dietary practice. The final note that, uh, that I want to add to this is on commenting on, on a nutrition being a, a sport. I was blown away this year at Park City Point to Point, that really long cross-country race, 75 mm-hmm. miles, all single track, really rough. I was blown away at how organized – Keegan Swenson, who ended up winning it, was with all of his nutritional, like the plan that he had. First of all, he ate a ton, way more than I did. Um, There are plenty of other reasons why he's a faster athlete than I am, but that's one of them is that he knows that he needs to take in a lot of food and he does that. But they had like, uh, since it was a long race and they had aid stations, but still, once again, nutrition is such a part to refine of your, of your game plan 
he had people placed at strategic areas so that they could hand them a, hand them a camel back in one spot, and then he could take in a specific type of nutrition there very easily, and then he'd be able to meet a person at the top at a specific because the speed or terrain was fitting for him to eat a specific other type of nutrition. Mm-hmm. Like it's very strategic, and especially with an event like gravel racing or mountain biking where it's it's not as easy as just sitting up and, and opening up a package and eating sure, something. Yeah. It's something that it really merits a lot of refinement. I was just going to ask you, I'm doing another mountain bike race this weekend and, uh, I wasn't going to carry a bottle cause the, uh, you guys ever, you know, race and it's muddy and mm-hmm. your bottle just gets covered in mud. Yeah. yeah. Not it, pleasant to put your mouth on. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> in that situation, do you carry a, a bottle if they have, if they have hand ups? Yeah. Yeah. I still do for sure. Yeah. But do you just so, drink the mud? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. And we're just. Yeah, exactly. Clean like it if, you, if you grab it with your hand, grab it and then rub off with your palm. Like that can be an easy way to do it. Um, now you have a bottle inside. You have bottles inside your triangle, so it's mm-hmm. not quite as bad. But if it gets splashed with mud and everything else, yeah, I mean, it sounds gross. But you yeah. might it, eat a little dirt. I mean, it's, it's no, it's mountain bike race. Yeah, I, I think too, it depends where you live. We I used to live in Minnesota, and my sister got giardia, like beaver <laughs> fever. Oh. Yeah, uh, twice. Oh. Um, and I wouldn't. Maybe in Minnesota, I wouldn't be doing that. But I think we mountain. We have like mountains Clear snowfall yeah exactly down and, yeah. so my other question is and then what about food so mm-hmm. um are you reaching in your back pocket because it's it's hard on a mountain bike race and this one is is as fast the whole time there's I, I pretty much have to give up time to where at carson city you know you have a climb and you can easily just mm-hmm. take it out and yeah it. yeah i i think that mountain biking is an ideal candidate for less solid food in the sense that it's it's just technically difficult to be able to eat it, right? Mm-hmm. And also when you're jarring around with your stomach the whole time, I've heard that that messes up, but I have no clue if there's science behind that. But I I actually, so I'm trying to change that right now. Um, I don't know if I want to mention like the name of the product I'm trying out right now. Sure, yeah, because I'm going to try it too this weekend. Yeah, okay. We're so, trying it. Yeah, so I've been trying it and it's been working well for me. For those that are listeners to the podcast, you know that my stomach is fragile as a flower. Yeah. Um, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. I was going to say, and they um, sent it to us. Yeah, yeah. So we just got to say that. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, the company is called Maurten, M-A-U-R-T-E-N. They were involved with Nike on their Project 2 when they were trying to go under two hours. Um, they marathon. were heavily marketed in, in hand-in-hand with that. Two-hour marathon. Two-hour marathon. <clears throat> uh, so it's it's extremely carbohydrate-dense, and it all it is is just a packet of, of, of basically a powder that gets put in there. They use something, uh, I believe that it's called like, um, they, they use, it's basically gel. And then what that gel does is that gel ends up allowing them somehow to pack more carbohydrate into your drink. It's like 90 grams of carbohydrates in one bottle. And it, the, the crazy part is it, is it doesn't taste bad at all. And it doesn't have much of a taste. If anything, it's like if you took a vanilla root and then just quickly like swabbed it through your water, like there's just a, a hint of something where it doesn't taste bad. And people around the office have been trying it too. And because the worst thing is those usually carb rich drinks taste for me. Is like the idea like that you taste. just take small servings frequently? What? Um, the idea is that you just fill up one bottle and then that bottle should be enough to give you plenty of fuel. Over the course of over the course of like an hour and a half race would be like one bottle or an hour race, something like that, uh, I believe. Okay. So. And then they have more dense. They have like double the dosage that you put into the same bottle. They're very strict on mixing it with the right amount of water. Sure. But uh, it's interesting stuff. And I'm trying that in hopes that that can be something that I can use for mountain biking because I face the same problem. And I usually end up taking in something like um, a block or something like that because I can just quickly kind of grab that and mash my hand and <laughs> mash it into my mouth and go with it. It's still hard though. It is hard. And then it's harder to chew that too when you're dealing with technical stuff. Hmm. Um, and, and then trash. The, the other thing that I've been working with is, uh, trying out and they, this is dropped off to us at cyclocross Nats, but from science and sport, they're gels cause they're much more watery than normal. Mm-hmm. And that's the first gel that I've used. that doesn't mess up my stomach. Cause I'm really trying to get away from mm-hmm. the whole, you know, using solid foods on the bike quite as much for like shorter races, especially, uh, cause Leadville looms large and I want to make sure that I have my nutrition plan down for yeah. that. So like, so. that's a good example. Leadville would be, we're going to have lots of solid food. Mm-hmm. and sports drinks but in a cross-country two-hour less mountain bike race where it's like yep. the whole time <laughs> yeah. like uh, that's me shaking my arms and jarring yeah uh, it's hard so i'm going to try that too this weekend chad yeah. you've mentioned super starch a few times mm-hmm. um and you like that for long, I, long slow stuff yeah. yeah i like carbo pro for the long slow stuff i with the there's i'm sure this company has a reason yes but 
I, I also think, well, I'll just put double scratch in. And I think right. Alan Lim would probably be like, what are you doing? That's <laughs> yeah. going to mess up the osmolarity. But maybe I'll, I'll try it and see how it works, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. try and see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with that, actually, we're gonna, I'm going to jump ahead because there's a question that specifically deals with this, guys. And then we'll, we'll end up jumping back. Um, but there was a, a question, and we have it as question number seven, by the way, guys. But it's from Scott. And he says, hey, guys, thanks for the great podcast. I've been back listening to the library of podcasts and I just listened to the pre and post podcast for Carson City Off-Road. A mountain bike race that last year was much more single track than it will be this year, and it is traditionally. Uh, it was pretty difficult to eat last year uh, because it was there. Were, I guess there was the road yeah. section coming back that was a time to eat, but uh, it was a lot of single track. It was technical single track and hot, extremely hot. hot. So uh, mm-hmm. he says it's possible my question gets answered in a later podcast. But as you all, as you all were talking about hydration, I was wondering about how much fluid it takes to digest different foods used on the bike, i.e., pro bars, gels, waffles, etc. My guess is that it takes far more fluid to digest pro bars and gels, uh, but is it enough to actually make a difference? Yeah, my guess would be the same as yours. And unfortunately, that's all it is because research <laughs> this as hard as I did. I, I couldn't find anything that was specific about, you know, the, the more um, dense a food product is, uh, any amount of hydration you need to tie to that. So I really ended up just looking at this in terms of uh, hydration versus dehydration and what the effects are on digestion. Um, and, and obviously hi- hydration works in terms of digestion. I mean, your digestive tract has to be, you know, flexible, pliable, um, remain lubricated. Uh, y- you dehydrate and you, you get constipated. It's pretty simple. Yeah. Obviously that's to be avoided. Um, one of the arguments is that ingesting fluid, you know, water in particular, um, will dilute stomach acidity and, and tone down the gastric juices. I, I can't find anything reliable that would support that. And I, and I found one pithy little comment by, I think, Johns Hopkins that says, nope, that's not true. <laughs> Didn't cite any study or anything, just said, you know, Johns Hopkins says says no. Interesting. Um, huh. So yeah, obviously you want to remain hydrated. And, yeah. and if you're putting a big wad of food into your belly, that could compete with with working muscles in terms of, you know, water balance. So that, Mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah. Something I wanted to add on this was think about when you are working hard at Carson city off road, for example, like just brutally hot, your body's throwing a whole lot of water out to the skin as much as it can to try to cool that thing off. And if you aren't taking in that water, it can really affect your ability to do that. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. To to process that food. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've, with these questions are so hard to answer because we don't know. There's not like a, a an exact science, or no, there probably is an exact science. There's not an exact recommendation. Mm-hmm. Different companies have very different stances on this for nutrition, so they're not even in a line. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and maybe some of that's marketing, and maybe some of that's science, but also it may be one studies here and one studies here, and they both take their own study or their own university. Yeah, I, I did find one study that tied uh, dehydration to to digestion, and it didn't tell us anything we wouldn't expect. Um, it, well, actually, there was something su- surprising. Um, it slows gastric emptying, so that, that's pretty obvious, and that can lead to stomach cramping and nausea. No surprise there. Um, it did show that dehydrated versus hydrated um, did not change intestinal permeability, glucose absorption, plasma volume, rectal temperature, or um, something else that I'm not going to bother you with. So that was a little surprising that mm-hmm. even in a dehydrated state, glucose absorption wasn't affected. Mm-hmm. So that's good news. But, you know, you got to deal with stomach cramps and nausea in, in that dehydrated state to still get that glucose. So obviously yeah. not optimal. And this is not a study. Once again, that was a study. A, or no, no, I was no, saying, no. what I'm about oh, to Chad. say is oh, not a study. Okay. Chad's was. Uh, but <clears throat> I can say this much, and I feel like everybody would be able to relate to this. When you put in food that is solid food or maybe it's dry food or anything else, and you don't, and you aren't taking in as much water. Oh, it can be extremely distracting. To yeah, performance. good luck getting that down. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's really tough to do. Uh, so I actually look, um, for example, like rice cakes. When I eat rice cakes, I usually water them. I use, I make the rice a little more watery than it would be, so it's a little bit more swollen, carries a little bit more moisture in there. Mm-hmm. I try to make sure that I, I pick foods that are a little bit more moist for that reason. Well, it's it's, it's tied really to tough. intensity too. I mean, and, and mm-hmm. you know, heat obviously a factor but if you're you know working working very hard and you try to put a rice cake in your mouth versus if you're noodling along at you know 60 percent of threshold and you can grab a, a gulp of water or two i mean it's mm-hmm. obviously that, that's a factor yeah i, I think the work all of this stuff is so uh there's some basic principles and i'm just gonna we didn't talk about this ahead of time let's see it's off the top of my head okay <laughs> uh basic principle number one be hydrated but don't. There's a limit, <laughs> right? To mm-hmm. there's yep. a you c- you can't drink too much. But uh, principle number two is if it's anything long, make sure you take in 
um, electrolytes mm -hmm. because you can actually in particular sodium kill I mean, yourself. Yeah. Well, when you talk yeah. about yeah, okay. So when you talk about hydration, it's I, I, I've these days I look less at water balance and more at sodium balance. I mean, the two are tied closely. But I mean, we we want our bodies to stay hydrated, but it's not as simple as ingesting straight water. There have to be certain things that go with it. And the more you sweat, the more sodium you lose, the more important it becomes that you balance that sodium back out, that you actually ingest sodium. And most of the hydration fluids these days account for that really well. Mm -hmm. And they also include a little bit of glu glucose, a little bit of carbohydrate. Those co-transporters, sodium and glucose, push a lot more water into the cells than than water alone. And so when you're in a race and you drink too much water and you flush out all the electrolytes, um, you, I mean, you don't have to be in a race for this to happen, but you can get in a state called hyponatremia. And when you're in that state, uh, That's the electrical low, low signals, blood sodium. Yeah. And you, you actually die. So at the uh, Chicago marathon a couple years ago, you can, I mean, those are the can. direst of circumstances. Well, yeah, yeah. But people actually died in the Chicago marathon and it's usually the, uh, the people that are doing the five plus hour marathons and they're drinking water at every station. Yeah. They don't want any carbs. They don't want any sports drinks. Mm -hmm. And um, you drink so much that you you actually like your body can't fire electrical signals anymore, mm -hmm. and you die. But I haven't ever ever, and I've heard about that a few places. I've never heard of someone dying of dehydration, which it's just performance awful, and you sit down, yeah, and you eventually get water. And so you the, come the back. whole, if if you're thirsty, then it's too late. You're already dehydrated. So what? So you're a little dehydrated. The 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 push is to drink ad libitum based on thirst. I mean, mm -hmm. your body's really good at regulating that sodium balance. You get thirsty, it says you're out of balance, fix it. Mm -hmm. um, and and to, to actually endure hyponatremia to a point where it results in death, that's a pretty severe situation. I mean, oh, these yeah. are people who are pounding straight water, even though they're, they're not sweating out anything, they're not. Well, it was a 100 degree day too, so oh, they were sweating okay, the whole sweating time, yeah. super well, hot. So, so that's it, they're just yeah. depleting those sodium yeah. stores to, to a, you know, to a deadly level. So the first one, be hydrated. Two, take some electrolytes if it's eating long. And two, if you don't want glucose, there are products where you can just get salt pills. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of triathletes do that. Not salt pills, sodium pill. Or, uh, well, yeah, yeah, it's, it's sorry, the, electrolyte the chloride pills. That goes along with the sodium is problematic. Mm -hmm. the, your, your body doesn't lose chloride at the same rate it loses sodium. So when you replenish with a salt tablet, you're adding too much chloride to the system and that causes its own host of problems. Yeah. So th yeah, and, and brands have their own, like Hammer has one, I think Goo has one, mm -hmm. or you could do a mix that puts into your drink and it mm -hmm. sounds like it would be like a salt water, but it's not. Um, the third one that I think is experiment with everything else because I've never seen where this is this is the way to drink and eat and then it goes right across all the whole board but i have seen time and time again somebody having this journey where they try many different things and yeah. then they lock on something that's awesome well one and then that's their thing one thing that influences that is is people lose sodium at different rates yeah i mean i mean per milligrams per liter of sweat you have a range that runs from like 300 milligrams all the way up to 2000. So you can be someone who just dumps sodium. You obviously need to put more <laughs> sodium back in the system than somebody who loses it at a, at a much you know, lesser rate. Yeah. I like my three principles. Yeah, they're you solid. Like, yeah, they're solid, solid. They're, principles. They're, they're basic, Yes. just like me. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're basic. But it's, uh, uh, but I mean, it's, a it's lot good. of people, they go, hey, Chad does this, so I should do this. And then they it's struggle with simple. it. Exactly. That's, that's my main point of this whole thing is, Experiment. Yeah, not many mm -hmm. people can do it. You can actually does. get a sodium. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <Not> many. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can you can get a sweat sodium test. Early That's... morning drinking. <laughs> <laughs> it's all beer in there. <laughs> yeah. Let's That's why I get friendlier as the this podcast, podcast rolls on. Sure. Yeah, there we go. Let's roll up uh, back to Daniel's question. Uh, so up in our dock here, but. Uh, he says, thanks for what you do. What are the, di and this is short and sweet. This is awesome. He says, what are the different adaptations that My occur from an over and under workout versus a three by 20 sweet spot workout? Can uh, you describe the difference between those two first for those who don't know? Yeah. So yeah. I mean, sweet spot, just, just pin it right around 90%, you know, whatever the range is, pe different people or coaches define it slightly different range. So let's just put it right about 90%. So we're substantially or well enough below threshold that it's not quite as demanding as threshold work. Mm -hmm. Well enough above tempo that it's noticeably more demanding than than aerobic endurance sort of stuff. And then over unders. Is over unders, you, you walk that lactic threshold line, so you're you're slightly under it, where the the you're keeping up with your lactic your lactate production, and then you push above it to where you're actually flooding to the point where your blood becomes acidic and you you, know, you start to back off, and then we we dip you back below threshold just in time to allow you to ride through it and clear it off, and then you know repeat. 
Which some Ad people, nauseum. based off of perception, might argue that it's enough time to complete. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, no, it's always it's brutal. always very uncomfortable. They're brutal, but the benefits that go with sw- sweet spot work, uh, as opposed to or along with uh, over unders, are basically the same. It's just a, uh, the order of magnitude. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a stronger stimulus. So the uh, if you use uh, Dr. Andrew Coggins' uh, expected physiological and performance adaptations, where he t- ties all the physiological adaptations that you'd expect from training to the seven power zones, mm-hmm. er- everything's basically the same. You just you know as you push more toward threshold and above threshold, you get uh, bigger increases in in different adaptations. So you know plasma volume improves, and that's you know that's beneficial in a number of ways, but especially in terms of thermal regulation, mm-hmm. um, cooling. Mitochondrial enzymes, so how well you know, your, your mitochondrial, the aerobic powerhouses, can, can do their jobs. Mm-hmm. Uh, cardiac output, you know, your heart actually be able, becomes able to pump more volume, push more blood and plasma to the working muscle. Increase muscle capillarization, so better uh, bedrock of, or network of blood delivering uh, vessels to the muscle itself. Hmm. Um, and, and, and a number of other things, slow twitch hypertrophy, you know, your slow twitch fibers get a little fatter, a little more capable of more work, a little, a little more force output. So these benefits are shared by the both. By yep. both Again, of them. it's just order of magnitude. Um, the one thing you do get with over unders that you don't get with sweet spot work is improved lactate threshold. I mean, and you actually do get it. It's, yeah. it's substantially better with over unders yeah. and lactate tolerance, which yeah, that's a key. is a little more on the psychological side of things than the physiological side of things. Mm-hmm. So why, which, but there's both. Why wouldn't I just always do over unders then, and never do sweet spot? Because they're brutal. So th- yeah. th- they're just hard. <laughs> and, and if that's and it's just like anything. I mean, you, you can your training, your uh, mindset stagnates after a while. You gotta gotta mix it up a so bit. But is, threshold or uh, sweet spot work does you know basically all the same things, and it's a lot less taxing on, on your system. A lot easier to recover from. You can do quite a bit more volume, as Nate has been demonstrating over the last couple of months. That's what I cool. That's what I wanted to get at too. With it's 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 f- psychologically demanding to do those over unders, physiologically as speaking, well, and physiologically oh, yeah. as well. It's a lot harder to bounce back from a threshold workout than it is a sweet spot workout. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a huge part, and you can get more time. So the time's not the same. Mm-hmm. I doubt anyone's doing three by twenty over unders. Oh. Right? If, I don't you, think if that's you looked possible. at it just in terms of training stress. Yeah, you can do. I, I mean, you can match the training stress between the two types of workouts, but you're going to bounce back a lot faster with the same amount of training stress from sweet spot work. Mm-hmm. So I, how I view it is like two, we have a limited amount of mental energy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, all that sweet spot stuff, which I'm doing right now. It's still getting a lot faster doing sweet spot, but it's it prepares you Keep doing it. for the threshold. Totally. Right. Yeah. And then when you get to threshold and it's, it's, those are, you know, we starting out with over-unders, I think, at like eight minutes, mm-hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. they're hard. And then we build from there and progress you through yeah. that over under Even six, I think they're short of six because yeah. they're, they're, they're tough. They're difficult. The, the one thing I, I could say, too, with, uh, and I believe this ties into a lot of psychological preparation, there are certainly physiological adaptations that happen, too, with over-unders like this. But in many cases, unless you're doing like a very steady time trial that doesn't have a lot of change to it or anything else like that, I've found that, when you get out into a race scenario, power changes constantly. Mm-hmm. Things are moving around. You're effectively doing over-unders the whole race. Yeah, a lot of the time you really are. And so I, I find that when I go into over-unders, so a lot of people, and I've, this has been my observation, a lot of people when they see over-unders on their on their schedule, right? That's the next workout on their training plan. It's ugh, it's like this is going to be really hard, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When I see those, I get I actually get excited, not because it's it's easy for me or anything else like that, but I look at that and I think, ooh, this is exciting because this is like really good race prep. Mm-hmm. And I know that when I'm doing this, I'm, I'm getting even more out of it. I don't do it all the time because I know that that's not smart because if I do it all the time, it's going to be tough for me to recover. But I do actually really like those workouts because I know I'm getting a lot out of it. Yeah, them. if you looked at it just from a, a psychological perspective, just being able to – to well your muscles up, put yourself in a really uncomfortable spot and to gradually work yourself back out or maybe not even work yourself back out right away to be able to tolerate it for longer, longer periods of time. It's, it's, it's a huge, uh, huge boost mentally. Saves a lot of time, right? John just talking about mental toughness, like mental games. I love what you just said Mm -hmm. about how to become faster. Mm -hmm. Another thing is you can't do over unders every day. So I know in our build plans, there'll be like Saturday might be over unders, but then Sunday is the sweet spot work. Because you can't, you know what I mean? You can't back it up yeah. every day because it's just, you couldn't do, 
maybe you could do two days of sweets or over unders together, but that would be like if I tapered into it. Even if you tried to alternate days, it would just grind you down. I mean, I'm yeah. looking at five, six weeks of that before you just wanted to quit bike racing altogether. Yeah, yeah, remember that when you dose your body with training, there's stress that gets put onto your body there. And when you recover, you're able to absorb the benefits really from that, right? And it's so it's something that's really important for people to, to consider. So. They, they, they both have their place. They do. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Uh, next question is from James. He says, I find myself in a more time-restricted morning workout slot than the questioner in episode 135. My alarm goes off at 4.45 a.m. and I try to be pedaling ASAP, typically within 10 minutes, so that I can get a full workout in before I need to get the kids ready in the morning. This obviously leaves no time for pre-workout digestion. Right now, I'm in high volume sweet spot base two. So all the workouts are 90 minutes to two hours in length and nothing that pushes me into the red. Mostly, I'm getting through them without no food or coffee, just water. But I've noticed on multiple occasions that the workouts feel harder than they should and workout quality occasionally suffers. Mm -hmm. I assume what he's talking about with workout quality occasionally suffering is his ability to hold the targets consistently. Oh, across yeah, the board. I'm sure of it. So he asks... Is there any benefit to eating the, and he has a number of questions here, but we'll just address them one by one. Is there any benefit to eating the tasty sounding English muffin with honey while warming up? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in your case, this is your only option, so you got to do what you got to do. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, if you ingest something right at the start of a workout, it's an excellent time for your body to, to uptake that. I mean, it, totally. it, it, once your muscles start working, we don't even need insulin to get the nutrients into your into your uh, muscle cells. Mm -hmm. So do it right then and there and, and expect a, a pretty immediate, you know, relatively speaking, benefit. What kind of food would you suggest then to eat right when they, right when they Super start? Super simple. I mean, simple carbohydrate. Um, you could probably get away with uh, something that's not terribly simple, but I certainly wouldn't push anything with fat, anything with fiber, um, basically stuff that burns quickly, yeah. metabolizes quickly. Minimum protein, too. Oh, yeah, and protein, yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, it, yeah. This goes back to our ketosis question a, a bit because um, how many people I've talked to who they're like, great, I did an FTP test, endurance workouts, great, mm -hmm. tempo, great. I did over under. I woke up and I did over unders and it was really hard. Yeah. And if you're on ketosis, you don't have those carbs. But when you wake up in the morning, it's not to the same extent as ketosis, but yeah. you don't have those carbs. And I feel like I, I can feel it myself too. If you don't, if you don't eat for your next workout, like I, I feel like I'm eating, I'm always eating to make the next workout hurt less. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah, yeah. And it just makes in training so much more enjoyable to go into it because the, the, the amount of power doesn't change. Right. That's, a, that's a given. All I can mm -hmm. do is change how I'm going to prepare myself coming into it. Yeah. Yeah. Right? We always talk about fueling for the, for, for the workout. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that workout isn't till tomorrow or, or the next day. And, and there are considerations to be made well in advance of really taxing, depleting workouts like threshold work, sweet spot work, over unders. Do you think, um, that James could eat anything the night before? Like maybe uh, something yeah, I mean, slower, like oatmeal before bed. I mean, he just wants to top off his muscle glycogen. Yeah. So as long as that's topped off for for something like you know an hour, hour and a half workout, he's good to go. For something that's you know hour and a half, two hours with a lot of work, a lot of you know co constant muscle stress. We're not talking like VO mm -hmm. two where you're on for a little while, then you're off for a, a good long while. But sweet spot work where for long durations you're yeah. working steadily, that can. Uh, it, your, your muscles can only pack so much. The high volume sweet spot based two two hour workouts, they're pure evil, Chad. <laughs> I, I know they're they're, they're, they're big fitness builders. They're huge burners. Yeah, and they're they're I'd uh, I'd say those two though. You have to be topped up glycogen wise, or it's going to be very mentally tough. Topped yes. up because yeah. again, I mean, what your muscles you you limit what your muscles can do when you simply rely on the, the carbohydrate you're eating. Mm -hmm. What you ingest cannot keep up with as well uh, as your glycogen stores can. So the onboard muscle or the onboard sugar stores in your muscle is far more effective at, mm -hmm. at fueling the work. Transitioning from this and this we've we've danced around and touched on this quite a lot already on this episode, but the next question that he has is how does pre-workout and intra-workout nutrition change depending on length and intensity? That's kind of what we're talking and, about. Yeah. yeah and, and something, once again, this isn't necessarily a light switch thing. It's, it's a, it's a system of faders that, that end up working together. So it's not like, you know, you cross the line and you're done and you never use that type of fuel again until you drop back down, something like that. But this is something that perhaps I think a lot of people don't consider uh, when they're getting ready for, for a race or anything else like that beforehand is, uh -huh. is not just, taking in what you can, but, you know, think about the actual work you're doing because it does matter, right? Yes. 
yeah, like yeah. the type of nutrition or the type of in, or the intensity that you'll do does to have a yeah, absolutely. On what you actually need yeah, to and, eat. and ideally, you know, you you eat a few hours prior. You know, three hours is, is kind of the cutoff to, mm-hmm. to where your body can fully digest it and it's into the muscles. It's out of the digestive tract or at least far enough down it that it's not going to affect you. Um, one, one thing to avoid, and I've experienced this and I know you've described it before is, is eating like an hour prior to a hard event. Mm. That, that's, that's, that's hard. Dang near the worst time you can do yeah. it. Cause it's like this imperfect storm of, uh, you know, like I said, w- working muscle doesn't require insulin to drive the nutrients into the cells, mm-hmm. but an hour prior insulin's in the system. So the insulin, insulin release has taken place. So mm-hmm. you got that working. And your muscles don't need the insulin. So, so you, you basically force yourself into this hypoglycemic state where, where your blood sugar is low because well, I just described why. Yeah. And it's, it's super uncomfortable. It and, and it's far from confidence inspiring when you're starting a race and you're already feeling low. Yeah, I start shaking. Yeah, and I'll, that's like, hypoglycemic response I, right there. I, while I'm riding and I find that I'll have to eat something and then it takes like 25 minutes. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and maybe I could eat something that's better, if, like if pure you're honey a, or something. If you're in a pinch and you're going to eat just prior to a race, do it just prior to a race while you're sitting there at the start line. Mm-hmm. You know, five minutes prior, listening to the you know the the marshal describe the and course. To clarify, it's that's not ideal, but that's like if you're in it's a not, pinch. It's not type the worst thing. No, it's, it's right? not bad. I mean, yeah. uh, we're assuming or hoping that you're already loaded up. Exactly. Right. So I do, I do both. I do uh, for a race. I'll do three to four hours before eat something big, mm-hmm. and then as I sit there. I'll be eating, choose. Perfect. Because I want that, especially for those mountain bike races where I know I'm not going to eat later. And, so and I start fast. <laughs> and again, principle three, as we go back, I'm, I'm just going to call it principle three from now on, <laughs> that um, I have tried this in training many times mm-hmm. and in indoor training and that kind of stuff. Um, that's all I have to say. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, yeah, here's the other thing I was going to say is for talking about different intensities. Yeah. Sweet yeah. spot based high volume, Chad, again, evil. There's so many workouts. And I'm doing like, I slightly modify the plan as we've, we've talked ad nauseum about, but yeah. six days a week, even on my easier days, which I always do was one called Baxter, which is just for those non-trainer road users, aerobic. I'm still thinking about the next day because ha- I could have do to on a plan like that. I mm-hmm. could do Baxter with nothing like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to lower my glycogen stores a little bit. And it's not that, it's not that glycolytic while I'm doing it. But then the next day mm-hmm. I've got. 15 minute intervals. You handicapped sweet spot. yourself. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I'm trying to, it's just a different, I don't think a lot of people think of it that way. The mindset is if I'm going to train every single day. Yeah. Look at the succession of your workouts. That's, that's a big concern, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to something as depleting as sweet spot work. Yeah. So I'm actually doing sports drink as I'm doing those aerobic rides, which I know some people are like, ah, oh, how yeah, could because you? Because they're thinking like, they want to not take in as much because it's an easier workout and it's a good chance to maybe cut weight, something like that. Sweet right? spot does not qualify as an easier workout. Not, yeah. not in my eyes. Yeah. It's no, tough they, work. You need a lot of fuel for, for, you know, 10, 20 minute efforts done at 90% of threshold. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough work. What about if you're doing something, Chad, like really short, like 30 second anaerobic efforts early in the morning? It, Assuming it's, you know, a 60, maybe 75 minute workout and that the work done in that workout is substantially less than that, considering all this time spent recovering, you probably, assuming you didn't starve yourself or skip dinner, probably have enough <laughs> glycogen on board and on board, I mean, in the muscles to, to get through that workout, no problem. Hmm. Then it's really a question of fueling afterwards to mitigate all the you know harmful physiological responses that come with that high intensity work. Another idea I've been thinking about is I haven't been doing any post-race drinks because I've been taking them just while I work out. And that anaerobic 30 second one is great because there's usually big periods of rest, mm-hmm. yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, right afterwards, I'd be like, I'm gonna eat a banana right now. Yeah, you can um, do it. And there's always, they talk about that window and stuff, but in my brain, I'm thinking like, I'm off the bike, it's already in my stomach. Everything, yeah. everything's there. Yeah. It's ready to go. What yeah, do you think and, about that? And as that? we discussed, that, that window doesn't close. Mm-hmm. So so it's not to say, I mean, you're you're, the I'm assuming the food you're eating on the workout is meant to fuel the remainder of the workout. Mm-hmm. You're not doing it as a recovery mechanism, Mm-mm. and that, so so that's what it is. So then, really, it's just a question of when you get off the bike, adequately refueling to you know to stave off any of the harmful effects of the high intensity work and to prepare yourself for the next workout. And hopefully, what you've taken in hasn't put you too deep in, or has has lessened that hole, right? Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. We that's... talked about. Yeah, it's, yes, it's Jonathan. Clever. I like that. And, yeah, and that clever. window doesn't close, right? We talked about that a couple podcasts ago. It, I mean, it closes gradually, but it never closes entirely. You're always capable of uptaking glycogen. Yeah. It's just you're really sensitive to it just, pro- just post-workout and, you know, for, for a while past that workout, depending. Awesome. 
We're going to jump into the last question of the actual podcast here, but if you're with us live uh, for the live stream on Facebook or YouTube, uh, stick with us and we'll answer your questions after this. Uh, we're going to go to Ron's question. He says, love the podcast and I'm a proud attendee of your first live podcast you did at Rafa San Francisco. Awesome, Ron. Good to hear from you, man. He says, my triathlon, and by the way, we we don't have one of those planned yet in terms of doing another one at Rafa Cycle Club. We got a lot of suggestions from you guys on where to do them, and we have those present and acknowledged and noted, uh, so we will be planning one at some point. Uh, but we do actually have some pretty cool live podcast plans coming up for the spring, so uh, we'll share those uh, when that has happened. So. Anyways, he says, my triathlon coach has never used triathlon or trained a road before. Hopefully he's used triathlon before. <laughs> and <laughs> I've asked him to select workouts for me, which I do twice a week, and get a longer ride outside on the weekend. He seems to select between VO2 workout like Baird and then a sweet spot workout. And Baird is a VO2 workout like he noted on Trainer Road. Do you have more guidance for a coach that is new to Trainer Road on how to best leverage the workouts or plans? He says, of course, he has his own plan for me, um, but balancing the workouts and everything else. Um, but And he said this may not be a simple solution, but he's targeting a half Ironman race in Asia in April. So this is something that actually, like, I, I've, I've dealt with a lot of coaches on helping them use Trainer Road, and a ton of coaches use Trainer Road uh, to manage the training of their athletes. Uh, so uh, we're going to kind of break it down into four options that you could do mm -hmm. as a coach. And if you're an athlete that is listening to this that has a coach, uh, this can hopefully be helpful for you too. Uh, and, and I think that, yeah, it, it should actually, I bet it'll bring to light features of Trainer Road that people don't even know about. <laughs> yeah. So uh, first one, what would it be, Nate? Um, option one would be the coach. This is probably the easiest for the coach. They just look through our triathlon plans and mm -hmm. cherry pick the workouts because they're kind of the same energy systems and just say, yep, I'm going to have that one on Sunday, that one on Tuesday, mm -hmm. and, and then I prescribe that to the, yeah. the rider. Can I take that one step further too? Sure. Uh, a, a lot of coaches I know just actually, or some coaches I know, they, they assign their athletes to just follow our plans. And it kind of gets down to like with a, with a coach, I think that at least for me personally, and I know a lot of athletes are like this, I, I find the real value of a coach is that like accountability mm -hmm. partner, a counselor, mm -hmm. yep. a person to – the, to guide me through. And, and even if perhaps that coach doesn't have experience in the exact race I'm doing, having that outside perspective from an educated person on the matter can, can be really helpful. So like, I, I think that, uh, that's, that's a true value in a lot of respect of a, of a coach yeah. is that accountability partner. Option two, um, on our website, we've got great workout filters and you can filter down the workouts and say, I want a sweet spot workout. That's about this, this long. I'm going to order it by uh, TSS. Mm -hmm. I can even search for uh, 12 by like 12 X and the, all, all the 12 minute intervals will come up. Um, That's pretty sweet inside of that. Yeah. So, and then we have a, over a thousand workouts. So that makes it a lot easier to find. Like if the coach says, I want to have my athlete do a uh, 12 minute sweet spot over two hours, yeah, they could just do that and then look at the four or five workouts that we have that fit that criteria and assign them. Yeah. The third option is one where actually the athlete could, let's say that your coach has specific workouts that he wants you to do, and the athlete could then use Workout Creator. Uh, we have a Workout Creator, and mm -hmm. you can download it. You can just go to trainerroad.com slash um, install, and you can see it there, or you can oh, look no, it's at download. A download, forgive me, yeah. And then you can, but you can look online and just click through the links too. But you can recreate that workout that your coach has prescribed for you too. Yeah, you can either pull one of our existing workouts and just modify it to suit your coach's requirements, or you can just create one from scratch. Yep. It's fair to say that Chad's quite familiar with the workout creator. So. Quite. <laughs> Probably the yep. most in the world. Spent a lot of day in the, inside that thing. That's true. Option four, um, the coach could create the workout. And then we have a teams function on Trainer Road where you can actually, a coach can create a team, add people to it, and then us give private workouts inside of that like shared library mm -hmm. so that when I open trainer road, I could go into like, let's say I had a coach Chad private team, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, no one else could do it. And Chad would invite me to the team. And then I could go into the team section and say, I'm on coach Chad's team going there and all the workouts are in there. Yeah. My sister's doing this. I can tell cause their Strava things say like some coaches put, they have the, the workout name as the date yep. and it kind of gets around the whole calendar and she's in like a group triathlon class. Yep. So they put in the date and it's in there and then everyone opens it up and says, oh, it's the fifth. That's right. And they all do the fifth. And the cool thing is you can actually just in the app, you can just look up the name of that workout, whatever it's supposed to be. If you're part of that team and it'll show up in your feed, it won't show up in everybody else's. Uh, your coach can just share it with you. So then it shows up in your feed. It's really easy, actually. Um, and some cool things on that, too. The coach can then 
view that athlete's workouts. Uh, you can view the athletes. Um, you can as a coach, you'd be able to view their notes that they left. You'd be able to see their performance. And you also there's like a for, there's a forums feature within that. So within your team, uh, if you did need a place to ha to facilitate a conversation and keep it isolated from something like email or anything else, you have that too. So uh, the Cliff Bar team, for example, they use the Teams function heavily. And they actually have like, they kind of have challenges like workouts of the week that they have to do. Um, and someone devious creates one and then they all share, share their commiseration thereafter. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's something that I feel like it's an underutilized feature and it's something that we want to, you know, it, it's something that you know, we would love to build out and, and make even better, of course, as we always are looking to do, but it's, it's something that's really functional and a lot of coaches already use. Yep. So hopefully that helps coaches and athletes with coaches figure out how to use trainer road a little better. Thanks for joining us, everybody. And once again, if you're on the live stream, stay with us and we'll answer some of the questions you've submitted as we've been recording this podcast. But if you're joining us with the podcast, thanks for listening. You can submit those questions at trainerroad.com slash podcast. And we'll talk to you all next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay. Live questions. Live questions. Uh, some Jared says, Nate, TBF this Sunday, that's the mountain bike race. It's a reverse course, so you might want to make time for a pre-ride lap. Ooh, and that's idea. just the point of... This is a short enough lap, 30 minutes at race pace, pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, I could do it in the morning. And I think, Jared, you are a very smart person. I will be there, and uh, <laughs> I think I should pre-ride it. Is it multi-lap, I'm guessing, then? Four laps. Four laps. Because yep. you're doing... No, that four laps is... I'm going to stay in sport. Cool. Gotcha. Everyone's... Everyone. <coughs> told you to stay in sport? Yeah, and, and I'm just going to stay in sport. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not that good. Well, it, well and even... Yeah, we talked about that. Yeah, we... Team last week. Let's see, yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's look at this. Oh, Charlie says he saw the leak on my Instagram and it looks cool uh, <laughs> of the of the new stuff that's coming. Once again, Trainer Road Beta Group, if you want to see that. <laughs> Ryan, Coach Chad is my spirit animal. <laughs> Ryan Muir says Coach Chad is a spirit animal. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, let's look here. Mm -hmm. Okay, our Alex just asks these great questions every time. <laughs> Alex's question is he says he's changing bikes in erg mode and his question is does the gearing is it going to change the feel of it mm. and um you want to go take this one yeah yeah sure so, i'll chime in on it too yeah so it's yes alex and uh i just had to talk to a user like two days ago that inertia that the faster you set up your uh you have your bike set up in erg mode so the like the the big gear up front little gear in the back bigger the ratio yeah yep the faster you go, the more that rear wheel will spin, and the more like closer you get to a real world road like feel. Depending and on the real world road like conditions that you have, I've, that you plan on race day. I personally always found that high inertia, I could put out more power. Okay. Um, I and, think I, and I'm the opposite, so, which is and it's interesting. I think that this is something that's important. I think a lot of people ask this question because they feel it, but it's not. And we've talked about it on our podcast, but it's certainly not talked about elsewhere. Um, Brandon Need, our our product manager, one of our product managers here, he's an incredibly fit cyclist, uh, like extremely really? fast. Yeah, like he's the fastest here, I think, on uphill. Oh yeah, yeah. Like um, he, he he holds with Levi Leipheimer up climbs and drops Ted King. So like uh, yeah, he's, he's, yeah, he's gnarly. <laughs> he's pretty. Fast. Um, so he trains in a very low gear. He's a very good climber. In his mind, where he's going to make or break any races on the climbs, that's like that's his that's his show, that's his stage, so to speak, right? That he's really prepping for. And in mountain biking, a lot of the cases it's really similar. Now with TTs, on the other hand, we should be going over 27 miles an hour. We should be carrying a lot of inertia, so that would be a different experience. I do find that there is a difference, and and it's not necessarily all about emulating like a road feel as in going fast down the road. It's emulating the circumstances that you would have whenever it really matters on race day. So specificity. Exactly. And it's not necessarily the one thing I want to make clear though is that it's not like if you've done the three hundred watt work and you were in a different gear, you're still getting a lot of you're still getting the fitness benefit. Mm -hmm. This is like a marginal gain cherry on top type of a thing to just get more specificity. So um, yeah, it does change, but it's not uh, gonna nullify anything chad this question's for you okay. bert asks hi guys relatively common <clears throat> questions i'm sure question i'm sure was flooring was he's doing sweet spot phase one i have missed a workout here and there due to work commitments emergency services how should i proceed i'm working towards an event in june and already squeezing the plan in what is the i'm guessing best build and specialty plans for my event coast climb 150 miles 
10,000 feet of climbing. So coast to coast UK, 150 miles and 10,000 uh, feet of climbing. So there's mm -hmm. there's two parts here. One is when I miss a workout, how should I proceed? Mm -hmm. And two, 150 mile, 10,000 foot climbing, what kind of yeah, base so and build should I do? In, in terms of missing the workout, if it's an infrequent occurrence, I wouldn't sweat it. And, and if you're still completing subsequent workouts, so you know these workouts progress and, and <clears throat> say you're doing a three by 10 and then the next one's a three by 12 and you miss the three by 10. If you can get through the three by 12, it's not a big deal. If however, that three by 12, you know, in advance is going to crush you just repeat, do the three by 10 and know that maybe by the end of the plan, you won't have completed the entire plan. So basically everything just gets shuffled forward. Mm -hmm. It's not the end of the world though. If you missed a workout here and there, um, if you're consistently missing workouts then you know, you gotta, it becomes a bigger deal. So that's, that's when you start repeating weeks, um, and, and either drag the plan out or know that you're not going to finish the plan's entire progression. That progression idea is so key because again, I'm, I'm, I'm going through sweet spot base and kind of doing them and I jumped ahead. I switched from 10 minute sweet Can spots really to 15 and I failed the 15. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I was, I was a little tired and stuff and I probably, you know, I always have excuses, but well, they, they progress at the rate they do for very specific reasons. Yeah. Some writers can handle bigger jumps in, in, you know, how quickly, how quickly their training stress ramps. Some writers, not so much. And if you're already kind of pushing the bounds of what you can do, it's really important that you keep those increases manageable, usually minimal. So if you do go like back one step, which I did, mm -hmm. you could kind of every one of, and usually the, those workers are all lined up in the same day. You could, if you missed a step, you could always just scooch them right back Shift one week. Shift back a yeah. week. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. And as far as which plans, um, I, I use this uh, reply all the time. It depends whether or not you're going to race it or you're just going to ride it. If you're just going to ride it, you're just looking to build the endurance necessary to last. Century plans are really good for that. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you're looking to race it, though, then you're going to pick a, ro a, a road race plan. Um, this doesn't sound like it rolls. It sounds like it's very much a climbing sort of endeavor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the climbing road race plan. 10,600. Aaron asks, um, hold on a second. Are you guys saying that normalized power can be lower than average power? I don't know where you got that, Aaron. Um, <laughs> we didn't talk about that at all during this podcast. But there is one special math situation where if you are – going a very high interval and then you go to a very, sh uh, then you go off and you're not doing a big, like normalized power window that can happen. You can cheat the system and normalized power is not supposed to <coughs> work with short durations anyway. So yeah. yeah. So don't worry about it. Yeah. That's, and, and that's like a total edge case. You probably won't see it. So, yeah. um, let's see. Uh, it's, Matt says, guys, I'm doing Ironman Maryland on September 29th. Cross season starts about the same time. How can I incorporate some CX training into the specialty phase of my Ironman plan? Oof. That's tricky. I don't know that I would. I, w I would plan on just finishing out the Ironman training and then getting into cross. Yeah, come what may. Yeah. I, trying to overlap those two, especially when you're specializing and tapering. I mean, getting right down to the to the event itself. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I don't think the possible benefits outweigh the very likely totally. risks or the downsides. I think it was episode 125, I think. We talked about triathletes racing cyclocross, mm -hmm. and we talked about the fact that even though in by by perhaps you know first perception you may think that it, it wouldn't work out, you can plenty of cross races depending on the terrain. If you're just a diesel in that cross race, you'll start slow, but you will pick people off <laughs> because they'll just hammer their way into every turn and out of every turn. And then they'll end up completely exhausted partway through, especially keep in mind, cross season is starting around then. So you'll see a lot of people coming into cross season with either weak fitness or the eager beaver fever type of a thing where they just can't wait to really push it hard. Mm -hmm. And your steady take actually might be a relative benefit for you, Matt. And the adaptation specific to cross will come along. Yeah, it's an awesome basis on, on which to begin your, your cross training. So I wouldn't yeah. sweat it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cross Chad, training I guess. Cool. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> this is a question for Chad. Um, Obo asks, hi, I've been inspired by Chad's VO2 max block. And this, so Chad's been doing VO2 max block. I did. Yeah. Three weeks. You want, do you want to describe that for a second? Um, yeah, I, I, I did the two and three minute VO2 max efforts are maybe my least favorite thing in the world or on the bike. Um, so I, I have to ease myself into them and it just so happens there's a lot of benefit with, uh, what's called short, short work or uh, super short work where you just work for a brief period of time, rest for a brief period of time, work for a brief period of time. Um, it's, it's, it makes it more tolerable in a lot of ways, um, largely cycle or one of them is psychological. Mm -hmm. 
um, rather than knowing I have to gut out a two or three minute effort where my basically your efficiency degrades for sure and your performance can degrade over the course of it, you can reap so much of the same benefit by working hard for 30 seconds, recovering for 20, working hard for 30. You accumulate the same amount of time. doesn't tear you down in quite the same way, but it does confer a lot of the same benefits as those longer efforts, arguably more. So I started with short efforts like... Uh, I think I started with 30s and then maybe went to 40s and then 50s, kept the recoveries at 30 seconds in, in a lot of cases, then started to trim the recoveries too. So I was spending a lot of time at a higher aerobic uptake, but I still wasn't doing long efforts. Mm. And it had the desired effect. I went from, I think I started the season about 270 and it bumped me up to a pretty safe, I feel good about it because I've been using it with sweet spot work, 300 watt threshold. So I got an early season kick and that was the impetus behind it. I didn't want to start with a 270 watt threshold, not not my training in earnest. I rather wanted to see if I could get just a quick little boost with some VO2 max work mm -hmm. and start with a what I consider to be, for me, a more respectable FTP. And I'd, I'd say for you too, like you have been at 380 mm -hmm. and this is kind of like getting back more to where you should be rather than like you're at peak fitness yeah. and you're expected. Because I don't want people listening to be like, oh, I can get a 30 watt boost by just doing a couple VO2 max work. Right. Nope. This is, you've been for a long time, much higher than you have. Yeah, been. and you can. I mean, it's not to say you can't, especially yeah. if you're deconditioned. If you're deconditioned, you can see massive yeah. changes in, in FTP and VO2 max over the course of your early training. But as you get fitter, they obviously become harder fought. So the, the rest of his question is, my respiration weight rate wasn't that high during Ansel Adams, which is like uh, mm -hmm. kind of like Bill Ott's 50 seconds on. They're 50-50s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, compared to Huffaker, which is like, 30 yeah. second build, two and a half and that's, minutes and that's of That's exactly minutes. what I'm describing here. So, so what's better? <clears throat> a little more tolerable. Um, it's not what's better necessarily is what's more specific to what you need. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're going to have to repeat two and three minute efforts at threshold or uh, I'm sorry, at VO2 max, you best practice them. You best get, you know, make mm -hmm. those, even if you start with 50, 50s, get to a point where you're doing two and three minute repeats. And that's where I will get eventually simply because there's a really big benefit that comes with them. And I don't just want to do the same workout all the time. Um, but they're, they're, they're basically two ways to skin the same cat. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, you can get all the same benefits with, you know, a different structure of intervals. The, the idea is to maximize uptake or, or mm -hmm. yeah, uptake. So put a big stress on the aerobic system, whether you do that with solid two and three minute efforts or 30 on 10 off 30 on 20 off, however you want to, uh, build that workout The the end game's the same to, to really tax your aerobic capacity. And we've talked about this plenty on the podcast, but I can't stress this enough. It's not just about where your numbers are in terms of FTP or VO2 max, but it's what you can do with that type of fitness, right? So like you said, Chad, it's two ways to skin a cat and whichever one fits befits the, you know, the type of racing you're doing, that's going to be yeah, one I was, the, the, the <clears> good <throat> idea. Excuse me. I was chasing physiological adaptation mm -hmm. exclusively. I didn't really care how well I did care. I wanted to do it in the least painful way. Um, if I have to be good at two and three minute efforts, I yeah. will do two and three minute efforts. Mm -hmm. That's the huge thing. And I was going to ask you too, Jonathan, when you're racing road and mountain bike, those two, three efforts that you're really good at huge can like, that is what changes the race, right? Totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, if you think yeah. about it, how many races are decided? So many of them are decided because you couldn't do that one extra effort. Like you can do mm -hmm. two to three minutes, but can you do it repeated? Right. And yeah. it's, and when people get spit off the back, it's usually because they withstood who knows how many or how much of that barrage, but it was just one too many, you know, and then and it ends up. Yeah. And, and honestly, w without getting hung up too much on the interval structure, I chose something that was easier for me to manage mm -hmm. and paid attention to whether or not there was a benefit and there was, so it worked. So it was a win. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to cover, well, actually first Matt Sturgis says a slice of, a slice of day old pizza is the best pre-workout fuel. <laughs> <laughs> I can't argue that. <laughs> uh, but Michael says, I have a quick question. I live in the Northeast right now and it's very cold out. I, d I don't have a treadmill. So when doing the brick works workouts, how long can I take in transition before losing the benefit of the workout? I have to change into my cold weather gear, which takes a while. Thanks. And for those that don't know, a brick workout is when you go from one portion of triathlon so uh, from bike to run usually in this case bike to run yeah a lot of the attendant intended benefits of a brick workout are learning to transition from the bike to the run quickly to, so to like carry that fatigue almost. into it yeah okay. yeah to maybe practice transitioning quickly but also learn what it's like to run with heavy legs for the first two three five minutes a lot of mental too yeah absolutely and yeah. you'll miss out on that um you won't miss out on the the piling training one form of training stress on the 
healer on top of another form that'll still come i'm not sure it's sure with bricks that's really the benefit it's not with me when i design a brick it's to learn that transition to learn how to how to work through that mm -hmm. it's it's not to carry a ton of fatigue into the run hmm. so in that, in that case i mean if you just have your cold weather gear there and you get you know get kitted up as soon as you can I mean, that's the best you can do. I try to make it I, it's super quick. It's a it's a great time to practice your transition too. Yeah. Although normally you're not racing in cold weather, but just doing things quickly and and all mm -hmm. of that is is great. Yeah. Um, Shane, I'm gonna paraphrase uh, his his question. He just said he he switched to keto, did FTP his test, and then he found that anything close to FTP mm -hmm. was super hard. He could nail the low stuff. Yep. Um, he tried to do like a fruit smoothie and help, but he says anything over 85 percent. Uh, he can perform it barely, but his uh, legs go dead. That's about right. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Just, uh, fruit smoothie too. Uh, just uh, mm -hmm. I've been experimenting one. It sounds nice. it's very Nate fruit smoothie. But I did uh, <laughs> tart cherry juice. Um, <laughs> there was a question actually in here. Sorry to interrupt, but that asked Nate, are you still drinking copious amounts of tart cherry juice? I am. I don't know if it does anything, it's but I like the taste. Though. It's good, delicious. Man. So it's good. Really and I, good. I found at uh, Trader Joe's or or Whole Foods, there's like a cheaper version. Yeah, because it can get expensive. There's like the Santa Cruz, I think it's called. Is like no, the brand that does like the. That's not the cheap one, right? There's a there's a store version, like yeah. a, a store brand. Yeah. But yeah. And so, anyways, it's tart cherry juice, blueberries, frozen blueberries, and a banana. And I think of that as my antioxidant drink. And I know there's some research that says like antioxidants hurt with performance adaption, but I don't. I want to live a long time too. So, <laughs> yeah. um, I think that like you know you two cups of blueberries and a whole bunch of tart cherry juice. It Why seems not? like an anti just, just from a health perspective. Yeah, anti-inflammatory. And um, I'm always trying to also make my legs not hurt as much. And I don't know if it really does anything, but um, I've done it a couple times. Had good workouts. Again, that's not causation. That's well, correlation. And if we can just dip back to that keto question real quick, one thing we didn't address um, that I wanted to when we talked about it in the podcast is if you look at muscles just in terms of their force capability, slow twitch muscles, the ones that work aerobically, they're really good at metabolizing fat, really good at stretching glucose, can't produce a lot of force. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if those are the muscles that you're relying upon and on a keto diet, those are the more aerobically inclined ones. You, you're simply not going to be able to generate a lot of force. Just mm -hmm. just look at it that way. Anytime you try to really stomp on the pedals, really get on it, you don't really have the fuel to to feed the muscles that can create those those bigger force outputs. Single speeders might not want to be keto, perhaps. <laughs> Absolutely not. No. Um, somebody or Jared asks who makes Chad's growler. All three of us are, and I know this is going to come as a surprise if anybody knows me personally, but all three of these are Yeti. So <laughs> it's pretty uh, much all brand, we buy these but, days. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Drinking and writing. I, they, they, just to say about these, they feel, I feel guilty when I buy them because they're so expensive. Yeah, they're they are. Right? Yeah. They're pricey, but then I use it every single day and it's awesome. Pro it's tip, when stuff. you are done, so riding in the summer and like you've driven somewhere to a trailhead or maybe you park somewhere, there's nothing worse than coming back to your car, being out of water, and then you have like a hot Ugh. bit of water left. And that's why I love these things is because it keeps it extremely cold. Cold so for days. Chad has the 32 insulated mm -hmm. one and then... This new one, the Chug Top, like again, it's like 20 bucks, but it's so much better to drink from. Yeah. And I use it every day and mm -hmm. they do the same thing. Before a race, I have one of these that I like. This is the post-race water. Yeah. That's And then you put ice in there and it's cold for two it's days. It's impossibly yeah. refreshing every time. <laughs> I does. love it yeah. so much. Yep. Awesome stuff. Uh, Anthony says, what's the best way to work in high force, low cadence work into my sweet spot base two plan? I'm looking to increase muscular strength and endurance and don't or and haven't done any low cadence work before. Um, sweet spot lends itself to low force or uh, high force, low cadence work. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of my personal cutoff. I don't really like doing anything above it. There are coaches who advocate and athletes who use high force work done at uh, threshold and above. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, I think the risks outweigh the benefits. Um, so mm -hmm. just, just in any of your workouts, if you're on an ergo trainer, it works really well. Mm -hmm. I have noticed some like compu trainer in particular, we had to put it in a huge gear ratio to get the slow force stuff to work. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that carries. I haven't done slow force work on a kicker or the hammer, yeah. so I can't say. But I do know that you can – I've altered my cadence a ton. You know, yeah. I'll go down to 60 and get out of the saddle, and it, it works seamlessly. So I imagine if I sat at 60 or 50, it would probably work just as well. Yeah, touching back on what we were talking about with – gear ratios affecting the the feel of the of the trainer when you're doing it mm -hmm. if you just shift down into a very low gear that's going to you'll actually feel the trainer in a lot of ways on a smart trainer you'll, you'll start to feel it yeah in erg mode you'll yeah. start to feel it kind of 
you have resistance fighting against you. It feels like for more of that duration, more of the 360 degrees that your pedals travel. And, uh, it, it can very easily put you into a spot where you're, you're you feel like, okay, this feels like I'm doing that yeah. slow stuff. And if you're not, well. not on a smart trainer, not in erg mode or on a smart trainer, just not in erg mode, just choose a big gear and, and just match your target, target power. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. That's the way to do it. Um, Alex asks, I'm going to paraphrase his question too. He says, uh, the end of an interval, that's like a hundred or 125% FTP. So hard one. Feel he feels stuff. that, yeah, he feels that his cadence starts to tip up without it actually feeling harder. He just naturally goes up. He's wondering what's going on there. Mm. I don't know. Maybe you're encouraged by the end of the interval. Just, uh, getting on to I don't know if the this two is... things that I think of are psychological <clears throat> and mechanical like a mechanical being something with the trainer psychological being what you just stated right yeah. there uh, maybe music maybe a really good beat hit um, but the I ha you might notice in certain situations and it isn't it isn't anything that the, our app does but trainers handle like resistance changes and and and, and everything slightly differently um, different smart trainers will and what you might, I mean, in, in certain situations I'll be riding and I'll feel like, oh, I kind of feel like a nurse has picked up on a smart trainer for a bit. And then I'll feel like, oh, kind of feel like a nurse has, you know, dropped back down a bit. I'm still doing the same thing, but mm -hmm. it does feel like subtle changes. So maybe you were feeling like a wave like that. And I'm not actually sure what's going on inside the trainer to do that, but I, I've noticed. Have you noticed that too, Nate? Um, yeah, a little bit. But yeah. I, uh, to this question, there's two things that I found out recently. One during Baxter, if my cadence is above like 100, if there's like this switching point where it feels much easier. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Two, I'm looking at my, I've done the ramp test and I look at the results of that. And as my power goes up, my cadence goes up too. And also like 110 is kind of where it tops out. And I've looked at other like short two, three minute efforts. And I'm always at like 110 is where I like to be. Hmm. I, which is fast. It just relatively. keeps it more aerobic. It's yeah, the same it's, thing. that's what I'm thinking. My legs are not the the arrow legs, and uh, <laughs> but I mean, I mean, so maybe Alex. We don't really know for sure, but maybe Alex is in the same boat. Is mm -hmm. that uh, yeah, just you? You guide towards more aerobic at the yeah, end. Exactly. Muscularly, he's more inclined to to work aerobically. In fact, if you're in the last, you have to be. So totally. Yeah. And the and the the thing to take away from this is um, experiment a little bit. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. that's why we're doing the cadence drills and stuff. And mm -hmm. I was doing. A normal workout at 90 and then halfway through i was like this is hard this is harder than it should <laughs> yeah, be yeah. and i went to 100 and you can actually see and it, it bumps up yeah and i was like this is easy and now. often enough things smooth out it gets yeah. a little easier to yeah be steady at the very least uh experiment with your cadence because the course will experiment with your cadence <laughs> yes <laughs> that one does, so yeah. like yeah. you know um daryl says does the order of the workouts during the week matter i sometimes change the order of the workouts depending on my schedule um, it does more as you move toward the specialty phases simply because i stack the week where you're doing your toughest workouts muscularly most muscularly demanding workouts early on when your muscles are in their most recovered state or freshest state mm -hmm. um it's not as much of a concern. Well, it even is when you get into like sweet spot base two and I've got your VO two max work done early in the week where once again, you're freshest such that you can accomplish, you know, keep those uh, higher intensity efforts you know, more productive. Mm -hmm. um, it's not to say you can't do, say you did your shifted so that your over unders were on Tuesday and your VO two max works on Thursday. Mm -hmm. You know, if that, if it happens, not the worst thing, it's, uh, it's not optimal though. I prefer to do again, the harder stuff when your body's the freshest. <laughs> Uh, this one comes from, I don't always comment, but when I do, you like it on YouTube <laughs> says, uh, what are the benefits of using machine weight training and free weights? We've talked about this a ton on the podcast and we actually have a video, uh, five strength training exercises you can do. Uh, you can check that out. You're on YouTube already, so you can check it out there and we have it on our blog. So blog.trainerroad.com. Uh, I, I don't think we need to go into the strength training thing right now, but we've covered it a ton on there. And if you do have a question, you can put it in the YouTube comments or on the blog. Yeah. I've do we want to talk about that at all? I think we're good. Okay. Yeah. Alex has um, asked again, he said, have you guys ever considered bringing a sports nutritionist to do a podcast and give nutritional tips for TR plans? That would be awesome. Would be. Um, Matt Fitzgerald, we, I think we already, we asked him live and he said yes, but of course he's <laughs> going to say yes when we ask him live. <laughs> I'd love to get him on. Um, we've tried Alan Lim before and the scheduling didn't work out. Yep. Uh, I think we want to do Stacey Sims. If anyone yeah. knows, so if anyone knows Alan Lim or, or Dr. Stacey. Alan Lim, I should say yes. that, or Dr. Stacy Sims. We would love either of them. Yeah, we've reached out to both, but it's either been a scheduling conflict or dead ends. So, uh, yeah, if perhaps some, some more encouragement will help them. Yeah, but we'd love to have, right? That'd mm -hmm. be great. Absolutely. Be, yeah. Awesome. We would absolutely And Matt that. Fitzgerald, too. Mm-hmm. He was my first pick, actually. Yeah, yeah his the yeah. 
Yeah, I and think, he, I think he Sam's delivered. In, yeah. So we can he we delivered. Can, yeah, we can verify <laughs> that he's he's good on a podcast. So if anybody is wondering, you can check out that podcast episode that we did. We did a live podcast with him and Rafa at Rafa San Francisco, but uh, that one was all about psychology uh, instead of nutrition necessarily. Um, okay. Jose says, I have a question. I'm riding my legs or, or my legs are burning. How do I get rid of that burning feeling? Uh, is it lack of water or vitamins? No, uh, chances are that's not the case. Um, that's, that's pretty normal to expect, uh, the, the burning feeling that you have when you ride. We've, we've been talking today a lot about the sweet spot stuff. And then we talked about over unders and we talked about when you build up that, that, uh, that lactate builds up, uh, that's usually assimilated with a burning sensation. I'm not sure that they actually know the exact oh, reason they do. Yeah, it's, it's the blood acidity that goes along with, or the, the current science says it's the blood acidity that goes with, you know, accompanies the lactate. So it's, it's hydrogen ions. Mm -hmm. So in any case, in the simplest case, it's simply your blood is becoming more acidic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's quite simply. So, so as the as the lactate wells up, so uh, your aerobic capabilities have been outpaced. The pyruvate is uh, no longer able to make it into mitochondria, so you start to generate lactate. Lactate gets shuttled back into the bloodstream, has to go to the liver, be reconverted to glucose. There's a whole system, but the fact is, you're not keeping up with that. The the mm -hmm. the pyru or the the demand aerobically, so you're starting to well up with uh, the byproducts of anaerobic respiration, and it's yeah. getting kicked back into the bloodstream, and it's acidic and it burns. And you'll never get away from that. You may, if you're riding at the same intensity, that will go away if you're mm -hmm. training properly. But you'll always be able to revisit that very uncomfortable place um, because that's just how our bodies work. So as you get fitter at the same intensity, it will be less. Um, somebody asks, uh, funny thing is that if there was trainer or branded hair products, I would actually buy it. Keep the great work. <laughs> <laughs> well, there Those we are go. coming soon. Just there kidding. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Some, um, Kyle asked, this is for you, Chad. Are there proper zones for carbs, protein, electrolytes? Can you take on too much too fast? Yeah, you absolutely can. Um, man, I just I had something specific I just read yesterday, and it's not surfacing anything. I think, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, proper zones for electrolytes, like I wouldn't think of electrolytes as like zone dependent. It's going to be uh, sweat rate, duration of activity, if you're doing 60 minutes easy spin, you're not sweating very much, you yeah. probably don't need to take an electrolyte. Yeah, so for electrolytes, I would totally tie to sweat rate yep. or mm -hmm. sweat amount. And then for carbs Soda and protein, um, I know some people, so there's, a, there's this, and I want your opinion on this, Chad. Mm -hmm. There's an idea that if you take a little bit of protein with your, uh, like your sports drink or something, mm -hmm. that you'll uh, cannibalize less muscle mm -hmm. for these longer events. Yeah, th I, I've, I've found plenty to back that up. Yeah. I, have, I haven't dug into it, but yeah. I do know that uh, a lot of the more reputable uh, sports nutrition companies include a bit of protein in their carbohydrate fluids. And even in, like, so the Honey Stinger Chews, there's a bit I, think, in there too. I think there's like one gram of protein. They all have just a little bit of protein, I think, to support that same That's a good topic aspect. to dig into. I should uh, burst myself in that. Cool. The way of it, too, I think of is... Just I try to take as many, many carbs as I can until I can't take them. Yeah, yeah. And then I switch to like something like a bar because it, it's hard on those longer yeah. days. And the intensity matters. Your your level yeah. of aerobic, aerobic adaptation matters. I mean, you can do a whole lot of low intensity work on very little ingested carbohydrate and maybe mm -hmm. even none in some cases. But as you start to work more, as you start to work more anaerobically, that means you're you know you're you're, you're not making as efficient use of of the onboard glycogen or glucose. So you're going to start blowing through that stuff, um, and it as a product of that will become more carb dependent. Hmm. Do you have a, do yeah. you want to add on to that same thing? No. Okay, cool. Um, do you mind if I jump in with a question? Go ahead. Cool. Uh, this we can one, just start the seven two hour stream right now. Right now. Actually, <laughs> We're two on hours that in. note, somebody <laughs> said the longest uninterrupted live webcast video is 150 hours and 30 minutes in oh, duration. We can oh. beat that. Jonathan. Was achieved by, a, <laughs> was achieved by a lifestyle or TV that. Germany or TV it was achieved by Lifestyle or TV uh, uh, out of Cologne, Germany on February 13th. Anyways, so yeah, that, that does happen. Um, I want to get, not. yeah, let's not. Nope, it's him. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> he just, he can do I it. I heard mention of me covering ba bathroom breaks, so. No. Yeah, every every eight hours, come in for five minutes. <laughs> five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the question that I wanted to get to, though, um, is – uh, oh, shoot. I, I just lost it, actually. It's tricky on YouTube. It's a very okay. small comment window. I'll jump Go in. ahead. I'm going to find it again. Yeah. A couple of people have asked, can you get train road workouts onto a Garmin head unit? And this is uh, a 
of course we've thought about this many many <laughs> many many times for years and uh we have a, an idea on it, and it's probably different than what you're thinking of, but I don't think it's just as simple as get that exact structured workout, put it on your head unit, and do it. I think that'll that'll be – it might sound cool, and I've actually tried this, mm-hmm. or I've done this myself, and it's super annoying. And it, it, it's <laughs> it not pretty annoying. It's really annoying, right? Yeah. Um, so we do have uh, – and, and the reason that it's annoying is, is – um, Well, let's – we, well, well yeah. just think of one thing I want to say is like, you know, you, with you're so used to executing your workouts with like perfect precision. Mm-hmm. So then when you get into an environment that doesn't allow that, that's why it's annoying. Mm-hmm. So, And so we have design ideas. Uh, we've gone into pretty far to fix this. But in the schedule, we have um, the thing we've talked about in Facebook groups, calendar, mm-hmm. another super special f- yeah, idea. Yeah, really? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. exciting. And that super special idea requires the other two previous ideas. Yeah. Um, and and that's public. We can start selling now that after yeah. the, our the launch in the Facebook group, we're going to work on a, the best calendar we can build, and then we're not going to talk about the super special idea. Yep. And then in there, we got to relook, and we might be doing something with Garmin head units outside. That's not a promise at all, um, because what we want to do is going to be hard to do. But if we do it right, it'll be amazing. Mm-hmm. But so, anyways, we just want to make sure the experience is really good. And I don't think with our current resources and roadmap, we can make that happen. I don't want to just like check a box mm-hmm. and be like, oh, it's out there. And then everyone go, oh, this is really hard yeah. and annoying. We aren't box checkers as a company. We yeah. try to do, we, we, we look at things as the best possible way to make somebody faster or something along those lines. So um, let's go into, uh, so this is the question, what to do when sick? Uh, so the question is infrequent mm-hmm. missing of workouts is okay, but what about if you've been out for a week with the flu? Mm-hmm. And cool. we, we've talked about this one pretty regularly too, as far as how to come back from it. Uh, but uh, Chad, do you want to do you want to throw out the recommendation? Um, I can <clears throat> I can say one thing that's um, uh, timely. Uh, I'm I'm kind of going through this right now. My f- flu symptoms have been mild by comparison, so I've actually been working through it. Did you have the flu? Not sure. It's the best call. I, it's in my chest, so I, it may not I have that same. Flu. It's like there's this other thing going around the yeah. cough. You're gonna have yeah, it for a, a month. lot of congestion. It keeps yeah. peeling up when I cough real hard, but. Uh, so I haven't had to miss workouts, but I'm not entirely sure that's a way to go about it. So I, I'm rivaling my body's resources or asking it to go two different directions and probably hindering my recovery in the process. So maybe don't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of missing a week, it's it's like uh, anything else. You have to kind of baby step back into it. So you're not going to dive back into your hardest workouts. You're probably going to do a couple prep workouts and then and then ease your way back into it based on how you feel after each of those workouts. Mm-hmm. Um, I So I get sick all the time, right? Yeah. And I think I'm, I'm having a better protocol around it. And Chad, I'm, I haven't talked to you about this, but the idea of like after I'm pretty much better mm-hmm. and it could take, you know, I'm still not fully recovered from my sickness like a month ago, but when I'm pretty much better, I first start with aerobic work. Mm-hmm. So nothing too hard. Mm-hmm. And then once I'm into like, I feel like I can take more to step back what we talked about earlier in that progression. So if I was doing, yeah, pick up where you left off 30 minute sweet spot prior. intervals. I don't pick up at 30 minute sweet spot intervals. I go back to the 12, sure. right? Or yeah. the 10. Sure. Mm-hmm. And then I, actually on this last time, it hurt me so hard. I went back to the 10. And yeah. now I'm trying to like go through it again to get through it. And the 10 was the right place to start because when I jumped to 15, I died. Mm. Uh, Tim asks, uh, does erg mode offer benefits for uh, for this type of training? And he says four by 10 at sweet spot, or four by 10. And he says, it looks like he's talking about threshold intervals. And my coach would rather me not use it and just adjust the training myself as, as on a normal ride. I'm not sure why your coach would specifically advocate against it. It doesn't, mm. if, if you're able to hold your power targets, I don't think that it offers any, any benefit in terms of, 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 you know, your training or anything else like that. But uh, no, I think erg mode is marvelous in terms of keeping you on task and keeping mm-hmm. your power where it's supposed to be. And really it, the only thing that's up to you is maintaining cadence. Mm-hmm. So if you want to practice or, or consistently ride it at 100 rpm and, and you find yourself grinding along at 70 rpm toward the end of an interval only well, maybe you're missing that that objective but you're still working at this, the proper power output if you know maybe you've shifted the demand in, within the muscle so it, it's not desirable if that's a problem then i could see a case against erg mode mm-hmm. but if you can maintain a proper cadence and keep your power on target uh, exceptionally steadily so in erg mode i think it's one of the best training tools there are and i've talked about so too much already but the i like having not in erg mode Mm -hmm. for those just because i it gets me like laser focused and i'm really engaged with that interval yeah and i'm like and what i like to do mentally this is just a mental thing i like to be on top of it yeah just like 
two or three watts yeah. where I'm always on top of it. And I'm like, like, yeah. it just feels good to doing be it. like, I'm, yeah, I'm doing it. Yep. Right. Yep. And, and I don't think that we have talked about that enough though. Like, like I know that you yeah. said that because, and the reason for that is I think that there's an assumption that you some your training is better or you're getting more fit or you have like a training advantage. And, and while it certainly can help if you can't hold your power targets, I, when I'm, I don't have rig mode. And when I shift and, and adjust my cadence, I can hit my power targets with even greater precision sometimes yeah, in erg mode. If you're missing power targets, I don't know that it has to do with whether you're in erg mode or not. Exactly. So, yeah. and, and, th but the one thing to your point, Chad, that you said that I think uh, is really important is if, if you, for some reason, or your ability to experiment with cadence ranges with an erg mode, with an erg trainer is awesome. And you That's just awesome. cannot get that otherwise. It's yeah, really you can, hard. You're never fishing for the right gear. You can make the right gear mm -hmm. effectively. Yeah, so that's one thing that I think uh, the the benefit to erg mode is definitely there. Otherwise, if you can hit your power targets with precision, you're good. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I just I think there is a, a lot of people who are like I don't have erg mode, so I'm not going to be as fit. Yeah, no, yeah. No, you and don't. Think you don't need, need erg mode to get fast. Yeah. And I think they need a smart trainer in order to like effectively train indoors, and and I, I agree. Nope. I disagree with that. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. Even a janky trainer you can pick up on Craigslist. <laughs> if, it, if it lets you work at the right intensities, yeah. there you go. It's kind of like a car, right? right? Like yeah. a car can get you from A to B. Yeah. And you don't need the nice, super nice car. <laughs> like, that but it's nice. Just before it's nice. This. Yeah, <laughs> it's nice to have it, but yeah. you don't need to have it. Right. So yeah. don't feel like you're not going to, yeah. You can still show up at the race super fit totally. on whatever you ride. You totally can. Sorry, trainer companies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mercedes and Audi, too. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they know. They know what they're selling. They do. Exactly. Luxury. Let's see. Um, and we'll just do uh, just a, a couple more here. Uh, I'm good. Are VO2 it. workouts harder for older cyclists? I really struggle. I'm 53, and they're the only workouts I have to reduce. Uh, it's... You know, we know that VO2 max diminishes with age, um, but that uh, just means you scale them down. I don't know that they ever aren't hard. I, I don't know that a young rider has any better chance at completing VO2 max work than an older rider. In fact, I'd, I'd wait, or I'd argue that older riders are more experienced and probably have higher levels of pain tolerance and could probably do them even better than the younger guys. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna go with that. Patting himself on the back over Yeah, there. so I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't use age as an excuse for ducking out of VO2 max work. I mean, it's, it's still a question of how your VO2 max scales according to your FTP. So don't just look at 120% as the end all be all for your VO2 max work. Maybe mm -hmm. you're 118, maybe you're 122, maybe you're 112. Figure out what it is and then make yourself do the intervals. And then as you go through that, um, that can change, right? Like Absolutely. Uh, an Ironman athlete who's pushed really high up with their FTP mm -hmm. and they do VO2 max, maybe they scale it down, but maybe you're 24 and you can get it up really high. So don't just, don't pigeonhole yourself to be like, oh, I can only be 115% of FTP for VO2 max for my next yeah. training. Yeah, even even a, an older rider, uh, 50, 60 years old, may still have room to push up, push the VO2 max ceiling higher mm -hmm. and higher. And our plans to take that into account they bring you in lower, mm -hmm. and they, they build you up with those progressions that we talked about. Yeah. So maybe you're one progression back, or you're always 2% down, but yep. you're still going through that progression. Mm -hmm. um, it's really a matter of how deconditioned you are and what your genetics are. Mm -hmm. So those two things are going to dictate just how high you can you can get. I have one more question. Last one. You guys don't even know about this. Ooh. Okay. Do you guys ever, have you guys ever tried waxing your chains? So Ooh. I am, I just, it's on my list to buy, is from, what's it called? I forget. There's molten a Wax. Molten Wax. There's also Wend is another company. But I think Molten Wax has a s special chain, doesn't don't they? Uh, tactical no? has a chain, and okay. so does Whipperman. Okay, the, yeah. wi the Tactical chain, Premier Tactical, like, like polishes every link on mm -hmm. the Whipperman chain, and it's supposed to save, like, major watts. I don't know if it's true or not. But major being probably we're talking like a, a not a ton of watts really. But well, yeah. What's major? <laughs> okay, I don't I don't even want to say because this is just what a user told me. Okay. But they said in their tests seven watts. That seems like a lot. Exactly. That does. But <laughs> anyways, waxing chains. There's been a lot of between a bad lube and a wax that has been tested a lot, and that can, the, just there can be seven watts, five watts, something like that. Yeah, and totally. it's just nice to have a clean chain. Um, I was gonna buy the 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 electrical like um, jewelry cleaning like the industrial one yep. so we can we can clean our chains awesome. which is huge because if you if you're waxing a chain that's dirty you're missing a lot of the point and also then yeah. the wax can 
it doesn't adhere properly to the chain. So then it, you know, you're, yeah. And it's just nice, even if you're not waxing, to have a really clean chain before your races. Mm-hmm. You put on squirt or whatever lube you want. Mm-hmm. And so you start from a point of cleanliness, mm-hmm. right? Without having to buy a new chain every time you do a race. Totally. And I was going to buy the Molten Speed Wax. And I was going to have our uh, administrator here wax her chains for us. Oh, Cause I like she, that. She, yep. She can do it in like a, a batch, take yeah. all the chains off, wax it, and we put all the chains back on. Yep. And we can have all wax change. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. yeah. Seems like with the equipment we have in the test room, we could do an actual test and see. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, uh, it's – it's. Oh, we can. Between a wax chain and a not wax chain, we can't. Yeah. Ride, it at, ride it at a steady power for Or even get that uh, the device that speed. spins a wheel for us. Yeah, those are, uh, yeah. It'd be hard to make it really precise with what we have with our power meters because they're plus or minus 1.5%. Mm-hmm. Like so, that's what they say. And, and we're probably looking at an error. Yeah, if you think yeah. about it with the yeah. power we'd be riding at, it'd be plus or minus 1% to 2%. Probably. But, yeah. but I'm going to trust the other stuff just saying that a wax a cleaned wax chain is going to be faster than normally the stuff we're riding with yeah right like the, sounds reasonable. dirty chain right so yeah. and the cool thing too what people don't know is when you run out of wax in a wax chain it's just a chain then yeah. and then you can just lube it as you want yeah so even if we do this every or clean it and wax it again yeah, yeah. if we do it every two months or something or every month or whatever we're doing it's still yeah. i like the idea of cleaning our chains really well does a wax yeah. chain last quite a long time the waxing uh 200 miles or so i think but some people say 500 i don't know but i guess when it's when the wax is gone you know right away because it turns really loud really fast i'm looking gotcha. at wend wend w-e-n-d they're known in the ski racing world they used to actually use their stuff for ski racing but they're actually getting into bikes now and they say fresh application of wend wax uh, after 200 to 300 miles hmm. so uh, that's what they recommend so yeah, and they say 10 minutes. You need to have 10 minutes of riding for break-in time on a wax chain before you would start to yield the benefits. So Yeah, I, especially with uh, muddy um, mountain bike races. Totally. Yeah, you mm-hmm. get stuck on there, you and the wax smart. should save or should prevent it from doing it. And then smart. longer races, we should do it for Lost and Found, Leadville. Carson City Off-Road, and then Leadville, Tahoe Mauna Trail Kea. 100. Tahoe Trail, like those are all long ones where – a four or five watt difference can be yeah. a minute, well, two minutes, at, three minutes. Look at the weather we had on Mount Ikea, plus going through volcanic soft dirt and having it fling up all for a yeah. good portion of the time. That's you, that's rough. On you had a yeah, you had a wet chain, yeah. and then you, uh, dusty, really <laughs> small stuff was coming up into your drivetrain. Yeah, my chain. The after that, my bike sounded terrible. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's Anyways, a really good idea. A cool idea, right? Dig so it, yeah. I think yeah. we can we'll execute on that, and it'll be a nice perk as for trainer road riders at trainer road. Pretty awesome. I'm into it. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us. And once again, we will talk to you all next week. You can submit questions at trainerroad.com slash podcast. We look forward to seeing you all then. Happy training. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.